Yeah, man, we are live. It's Thursday Here night reality check. And I've got an awesome special guest tonight, and everybody is going to be stoked. We have Arthur Kwan Lee. Arthur is an incredible artist. He is outspoken. He is a he is a man in all sense of the word. Arthur, welcome. Thank you for having me, Tony. It's uh it's about time. Yeah, yeah. I met you um personally at uh, the Bond event with Jesse Lee Peterson, probably what that probably over a little over a month ago. Yeah, Jesse's a beautiful human being. And he had me on the fallen state mm -hmm. where that was one of the linchpins out of many that caused the radical left in New York City to be preposterous with me. Oh, boy. Yeah, I would imagine. Um, Jesse is quite polarizing. I love him to death. You know, I've, I've had the uh, pleasure, like yourself, to spend time with him. And um, I would recommend that to anybody if they ever get a chance. But uh, tonight is a reality check about Arthur Kwan Lee. And we're going to talk about you. We're going to talk about your life. We're going to talk about your backstory. And I guess the first thing is we want to find a little little about you, like um, where'd you grow up and everything else. Sure. So if any of your audience sees my paintings, the first thing they're going to notice is that it's drenched with religious iconography, masculine imagery, and traditional symbolism. And that's sort of the language that I'm known for. And there are roots to that. And the roots are the fact that, you know, my family structure was very traditional. My father is a minister. And my mother is a composer. So I often tell people I'm a visual fusion where I'm exploring these ideas in the realm of painting. And that's sort of the um, inception of where it comes from when it comes to my family roots. But then there's also the fact that I have a deep martial art background that we talked a lot about that at the uh, yeah, yeah. in Orlando together, right? <clears throat> so there's these different elements. And I often say that an artist is like sort of their own like cultural sommelier. Like anything that's inspired them, they sort of, you know, um, pull from it and then it manifests into their artwork. So the diversity of mark making, the color combinations, the intensity that I'm trying to enunciate, and then the traditional imagery that implies something pedagogical. These are all values that I uphold in my own life and I'm trying to pronounce it aesthetically as well. So I sort of have this disciplinary background from a Korean American family that is uh, patriotic and you know, hierarchical in all senses. Now, it, now you say traditional, traditional family, traditional background. Explain that a little, a little deeper, as far as your mother, father, and family. My father is the head of the home, and my mother obeys him, and they had a bunch of kids. And mm -hmm. I guess when I say traditional, this is the same sentiment I have: is that you know, I'm not a uh, pickup artist, MGTOW, hookup culture kind of guy. I'm not that, I, I mean, two each is their own. I'm a traditional guy myself. I'm a, you know, I believe that the whole point of interacting with your opposite sex is to have children. Mm -hmm. So in, in that same light, that's sort of my, uh, I guess the example that was set for me. And that's probably, that's the physical level, but then there's also the spiritual and philosophical level, which is more of my interest, but uh, it's sort of the same pattern, the idea of there being a transcendent morality that you should connect to, you know, in order to step your game up as a man. So when you were young, did you say, I'm going to be an artist? Or when did you know that you could paint? Because that is, that's another question. Is that your only media? And I'll throw that. As a little well, 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 first, yeah, uh, I, I pretty much dedicated my whole life to the brush. And, you know, there's this whole sentiment that, you know, they say that the pen is better than the sword, right? And, and but I guess my feeling since I was a child was that I think the brush is mightier than the pen. And mm -hmm. I say this because I was actually on the National Olympic team for Taekwondo okay. uh, for, for uh, under 18, junior, junior nationals. And I was at this point where I was offered to go on the senior Olympic team or I could go to art school. Now, mind you, at that time, I didn't realize art school was a postmodern 
brainwashing institution at that time. I didn't know. But the crossroad was still the same for me at that age. It was, do I want to focus my energy into creating art or do I want to focus my energy onto the mat? And I mean, I love fighting, but I wanted to kind of explore the warrior archetype in the realm of ideas. If that makes sense. So yeah. I was attracted to painting um, because I could be my own master in that way. But you're going to notice uh, that both martial arts and visual arts, they're both very independent fields. And I think that's another part of it because, you know, often when people say, oh, I'm an introvert, oh, I'm an introvert, they say that because they're actually just insecure and they don't like to be social. But when I say I'm an introvert, my my exploration is attracted to deeper truths. And I, I think there's the seeds for, for our future to, I mean, all the wisdom are planted in going within. And I, and I caught that very early. And it could be because I had that religious orientation in my home. But, you know, I was gifted by God to have this aesthetic power. So I'm going to yield it towards the logos. And that was sort of my attraction to it. Do you think everyone can be an artist in their own way? Yes, yes. I, this is a big belief that I have. Everyone says, oh, I can't be an artist. That is, first of all, that, that, that's crap. Everyone can be an artist, but it doesn't mean everyone can be a painter. And, and, I, and let me make it clear. There's no such thing as medium superiority, but there is such thing as medium specificity. So I can't say, I can't say for you, but maybe, you're gonna, maybe you'll pick up the guitar. Maybe you'll pick up welding like my cousin did. Maybe you're oh, going to get into woodworking. You're into carpentry. So I, I do believe everyone has a way to channel that magician archetype. I think everyone can be an artist, but I think it's about finding that materiality. And that's usually where the parents come in. They have them try all these different disciplines to have a rich life and they can find something to um, enjoy, to have the deeper pleasure. You know. So I think um, it's really important when you're young to – explore different materiality and mediums and hopefully your parents can support you to do so because sometimes that's financially obligated so but i think it's important to discover what that is for you and i believe that everyone can uh at least experience the cathartic appreciation of making art like i'm i'm on a drug here you know a healthy one of discipline and meaning that i produce in my studio so let, let me ask you a question. So what is art? A simple question. So when you say, for people that don't know, the medium, I guess, would be how you display your art or your form of art. Would that be the medium? Mm, yeah, yeah. When I say medium, I mean genres like painting, photography, play, ceramic wheel, dancing, comedy. There's so many different forms of artistry. Even martial arts is an art because there's that creative expressive side to it. But when you ask me what is art, uh, that's a very, such a big question that I'm going to have to um, show my bias a little bit. Art is the production of self-expression backed by objective standards. So that's how, I, that's how I put it, which is pretty much a monkey wrench to the American elite that run the gallery scene in New York City and Los Angeles. So art is objective, not subjective. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Let me make this more clear. Whenever you see the aesthetics in the gallery, you have to understand that if you look at this is as a person who won two time artists of the year, who is a defector from this elitist world, a person who's in White Hot Magazine, Art Verge, all of these uh, different channels, I can I can tell you straight up that when you see work that is utter garbage, you say, "What the hell is this?" It looks like 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 some girl like had her period on top of the paper. They hung it up, it's selling for quite a bit. There's a couple things to understand. Without getting into the money laundering component or the tax deductions that they're doing, because there's a lot of illegal illegal activities behind it, which is a big big part of it as well. They're not going to admit it, but it's a fact. Without that component, there's the other end, which is if we're going to look at it philosophically, the actual reason why art is in existence in the first place. All of that stuff is produced by people on the left. When you look at artwork produced by conservatives, very rarely you'll see it as um, 
highly abstract art. I mean, they're there, and I do like a lot of abstract artists, but generally speaking, if you see conservative artists, because they're conservative, they believe in boundaries, and they can define beauty. Beauty, by definition, is identifiable boundaries pushed to the nth degree. Look at a bodybuilder, look at a beautiful car, look at a well-rendered painting. So if you look at it from that perspective, the left, they believe in aesthetic relativity. The right, they believe in universal standards or, or hierarchy. So there's objective standards behind it. And my whole life's work was trying to make art great again, right? Taking a page out of uh, the president of the manosphere here. That was my whole life's work. I was trying to make art great again. Um, but yeah, right now, it's, it's um, the politically correct scene is what's ruined the art world. You know, because because politics is downstream from culture, the politically correct culture is what's destroying the arts today. Yeah, that's 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 kind of sad because let's say let's say somebody wanted to to purchase one of your paintings. Okay. Yeah. They might like your painting. They want they want that in their home but they won't put it on the wall because it's you. Is that correct? The liberals, <laughs> you know, you know, it's funny. I, I, I've gotten messages from like these, these feminist critics and all, they've even told me like, you know, if you, if you painted more woman figures or, or gay figures, I'd want to write about you more because your painting technique is at the caliber that deserves writing, but I don't like what you're representing. And this is before I became outspoken, before a man spoke up with his word. I was just painting. But nonetheless, the imagery I was painting, you know, it, it was all in support of something higher that is promoting decency, right? Religious figures, you know, masculinity, <laughs> a lot of warriors, trying to make people understand the sacrifices when you study history that undergirds the freedom that most Americans take advantage of. All of the imagery that I'm attracted to was specific for that reason. And I will say that the vast majority of my collectors right now, like most of my collectors are actually military veterans that are like entrepreneurial spirit anyways. So most of them are badass. They don't even care. I have some MMA fighters actually that collect my art. Like they don't even care about what the mob says for the most part because those are strong men. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But having said that, the people who do like my work that are in the art world, they collect my art here and there too. And they're, um, they don't show it off to their peers so much, you know, in that, in that circle. But I mean, I, I don't know what to say about that. It's, it's disappointing that they're functioning under this neurosis, but. I, I, think, I think some people would think that, that art or artists can be are feminine. I mean, there's, and I think that's maybe with our, what kind of our political, social, I guess, um, environment that we're in right now. So how, how is art masculine? Now, when I think of, and you could ask anybody, and I've done a little survey before I've spoke to you, and I've asked people to just randomly name me an artist that they know. And do you know not one person has mentioned a woman, including women? Why is that? Well, 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 it's it's funny because today the art world is dominated by women. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. None of them are producing work. There are some I can name. Actually, I, I'm friends with some women too that I can name that, that have the quality. But it's funny because even today, those women who do produce exceptional art, they're still functioning with the conscientiousness of these universalities. They're mm -hmm. still exercising hero worship. They're still honoring the masculine. Like the only way, let me put it more clearly. You study art history, okay? This feminized, postmodern, radicalized art that is about identity, identity politics today, that is all deeply connected to feminism. That's the first thing. <clears throat> the historical roots are connected to feminism. And Tom Wolfe wrote this in The Painted Word. He's an American cultural critic who first noticed what was happening with the art industry. But here's the thing, uh, when you study the greatest works that move a man's bones to their guts, they're all created <clears throat> or supported by masculinity. 
masterpieces are produced by masculinity. And this is something I've been always telling people because men have the capacity to endure suffering. We are the ones who take, have the risk-taking quality. We are the ones who are, um, have the leadership, the right qualities to make novelty reach a certain height. So men are the ones who've always produced masterclass work. And men are also the ones who always patronize them. The Medici family, all those Roman generals, wealthy patriarchs, they're literally the ones who were supporting the artists too. You have to understand that before the 1980s, painting was a masculine endeavor. All fine art was with that mm -hmm. in regard. But art universities with the Frankfurt School, you know, art and the social world is a um, something written in the Frankfurt School that all art academics today, basically all their ideologies are stemmed from this. And um, yeah, it's a shame because art universities are basically telling people to use their art as a political arm rather than, I don't want to say religious, but traditional. You know, so art so is supposed to preserve tradition. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is the, some of the art or a lot of the art that's coming out now is more like propaganda is what it is. Oh, it's deeply propagandistic. propagandistic. You go to the Lower East Side. I'm banned, by the way. My blacklisting, you know, we talked about this. I'm banned all over the Lower East Side. You know, it's so strange that I'm in this liberal hellhole of New York City. I came here because I was invited to a fabulous residency. That was a great program. They're not woke. They just gave you the space. You're very selective. It's a competitive program. That's great from a resume. That was my thinking. I came here. And then I was getting all these solo shows. I was getting all these shows. I was getting all this attention, getting written about left and right. But I was still doing this beta male social camouflaging of not truly speaking my position. And then, um, I'm only sharing this with you, Tony, because every single individual listening who is a supporter of the good and a creative, this is your story. <laughs> this is your story. And yeah, the Lower East Side is, the, you know, these people all hang with each other and they're, they want Black Lives Matter art, feminist art, and LGBTQ art. That's, that's pretty much the, the ethos of that whole area. And um, I'm not about any of that shit. Yeah, I mean. <clears throat> There's no respect in any of that. As an artist, do you really consider that art then? I don't, but um, I think our standards are so low now because the, the, the degeneracy and vanity is so normalized that people are, uh, I think everybody in New York City that embraces the culture that is New York, is, they're, all just, they're all traumatized. I think every single person in this city is traumatized by how they act. They don't know how to function like you know, self-preserving individuals whatsoever. And, you know, if, if they hear about my conservative predilections, I'm castigated with this huge weird reaction. And it, it just tells me there's, there's something in the air, man. Wokeism. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's a great term right there. Wokeism. <laughs> But, but here's, the, here's the good news, you know. The good news is, you know, I, I was already offending all these feminists and, and getting so much hate and vehemence towards me. And even when I was put on New York City Antifa list, that freaked me out at first. Like all this weird stuff. And then when I, you know, this is years ago when I discovered the 21 convention, I go, hmm. Okay, I'm already getting all, all the people that hate the dream team. Also, they also want me to get bent. Like, hmm. Now, like, and, and at this point right now, like, I'm pretty much the, the, the artist in this uh, Justice League that Anthony's putting together. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand, you know, the Warriors, you know, the Warriors first come because they're more ballsy than brainy in a way, no offense. You know, so mm -hmm. we get all the trainers and all the, all the uh, martial artists. They, they, they hop on it. And then the intellectuals come. And then the spiritual men come. You know, we get the pastors. And then, but the artists are going to come too. And then once the artists back you up, then you guys also have your hands on the cultural wheel. And I do believe that this masculine enlightenment, we'll call it that. This is, you know, once we get all those four sectors in the mix, that's when things are going to proliferate. Because every time people are looking for the truth, whatever their background, they're going to go, oh, there's a place for artists here now too.
oh, there's a place for the religious. You know, there's going to be these different channels where we say, yeah, we're going to, we're not going to, we're not going to ask you, how does this support Black Lives Matter? You know, <laughs> yeah. which I've had, I had this shit, you know. Yeah. Now let's go back a little to, uh, you're going to be a speaker at the 21 convention in October. Do you want to give us uh, just a little teaser on what you'll be talking about? Yeah, I'm going to talk about how, like, m my ultimate goal, you know, because this this pertains beyond beyond um, just the just the presentation I'm going to be showing, which is something that I'm excited to share with the manosphere. But my ultimate goal is to try to inspire men to participate in the arts one way or the other. This is something that I'm really big on because for so long I was wondering why does the radical left care what an introvert painter in a studio who's not out there publicly fighting anyone or trying to influence any minds think so much? Like, why are you guys attacking me? And I, I for some time, I couldn't put a life of me understand why, but Believe it or not, I, I mean, it's, it's been clicking more and more. And the first thing I realized is it's simply the realities of how information is disseminated. Because you can either do stack up all this evidence, data, you know, get as much red pill st statistics as you can, and conservatives will always win there. They don't want to dance with us toe-to-toe -to -toe there. Or you can flood big tech, academia, Hollywood, art gallery, you know, all these, you know, media, like all these different forms of artistic influence, which is really what programs people, especially young people, without them even having to debate it. And that's why they're so affected, because they're too busy influencing and controlling the narrative. What, okay, what controls the narrative? Not what tells you the aftermath and what tells you in an echo chamber the backed up information and supports your position. What controls the narrative? The arts. Because the aesthetics are what controls the tonality. You know, good guys and the bad guys, heroes and villains. That's really what we care about when it comes to these territorial disputes. And if you can control the language by controlling the aesthetics, you know, of course they're gonna of course they're gonna keep brainwashing the masses and getting young people on their side. It's it's to me it's been very obvious. And this is why I believe, because they don't wanna go on this side, like I told you. The moment we get some conservative, we need those stoic data-driven men staying there. But the moment we get some artists here, that's why they reacted that way. Now it's clicking to me because I've spoken to all these other creatives who believe in the same things. And they've all told me the similar stories. You know, one, one, at one level or another, it's always the same thing. It's, yeah, I was just so surprised. I couldn't believe this was happening. Or, or I can't believe they wanted to, you know, cancel my contract. Or this booking agent didn't want to work with me anymore. And I just, I couldn't help but tell them, listen, I've heard the story enough now because I'm pretty much fully public about being a defector from this anti-American elite. And I'm aware, I'm aware of why they don't want men, especially conservative men uh, in the arts, because then that, because they believe they own that space. So is it, are you taking, are you taking more heat for your personal views or your artwork? My personal views, I mean, I mean, it's connected to my artwork, but you know, like my painting, like when I'm painting, it's uh, there's like a religious feeling when I make work, mm -hmm. you know. So it's kind of like I'm trying to bring reverence because I believe reverence is the antidote to the decadence. So that's why I'm painting so much religious figures, because so much will, so much towards the good I can influence by painting that sort of feel, spirituality, but. You know, as, as many people as that brings in, it pushes them away once they figure out like that I voted for Donald Trump or that I don't believe the sentiment of stop Asian hate, like like whatever the whatever the hell it is. Like it's 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 preposterous. But I'll tell you right now, every time I have a show, the people that don't know me, every single one that walks in, they open up their phone. They type my name, they follow me on Instagram. And, then, and so, so every time I have a show, I get like hundreds of followers. And then every time they see stories, they unfollow. 
So it, it's I, I've come to notice that it's like um, it's like the S and P five hundred. I always get some and it goes low, but then it's always a little bit going high, so it's fine. Like if I shut, like it's it's just really interesting because I had my assistant like telling me like, hey, listen, um, I agree with you, but do you want to be an artist or do you want to be like a cultural fighter? I'm like, well, to me they're the, they're connected. To me, the whole functionality of being an artist is to push against the dominant narrative. I thought artists are supposed to be counterculture, and to me, the most counterculture thing you can be is a conservative. You know, rather than wearing a red hat, I mean, rather than wearing a le leather black jacket like in a punk rock era, you wear a red hat, and you're going to get just as much same hate. So for me, like, I'm actually, it's a very important to make it clear that I'm actually a conservative Tony, for aesthetic reasons first, mm -hmm. believe it or not. I'm a conservative for aesthetic reasons more than economic policies, immigration, taxation, whatever our issue is. I agree with all that data point too, but I'm a conservative because men should be in shape. They should carry themselves with confidence and women should be feminine and submissive. These are aesthetic things. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm not talking about getting your dick wet. <laughs> I'm talking about what is the presentation of how things should be packaged. You know, I, I mean, people say, oh, you think everyone can have a white picket fence? No, no, no. But my point is we should have standards and, the, you know, we, we have to lean up our lean ourselves towards those standards. And I think that we need to maintain those identifications. Otherwise, it'll be nothing but toxic. Yeah. Now I'm going to, you brought up uh, aesthetics. Now, when I met you before I met you, and this is just a preconceived notion. I thought you were going to be a smaller guy. You are a monster just for anybody that knows oh. you're, you're he's a, Arthur is a big dude. He's not, he's not a little guy. He's a big dude. I'm going to guess and say you're probably 210, maybe 200. 215. Yeah. I was gonna say, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> thought about that. <laughs> Arthur is not a small guy. So when I had first saw him, I didn't know. I knew your face, but I just couldn't put your basically your physique with your face. And so then I'm like, okay, maybe it's now, an Asian thing too, because Asians are usually super slim. Yeah, you know. Yeah, we're, we're usually, you know it. I don't know, but um. Uh, you're a beast too, man. You're like, you're about to do Seo Nagis on me and, and smash yeah. me on the floor. He was like ready to fight. <laughs> That's great. But so, so just for anybody that knows, you know, you're actually a super fit guy. And I know that comes from your martial arts background. And of course, wanting to take great care of yourself as a man. I think that's. Yeah. You, you know, it's important to recognize that like most things in life actually are circumstantial. And I'm, I'm, I'm connected thing, connecting this to what you're saying because I, I was reading a, one of the old lectures of Aristotle that his students were writing. And he had this big town hall lecture. And at that time, it was in his heyday. So it would get packed pretty quickly. And the word has gotten around is Aristotle. This is the philosopher of our time. And the first thing he did is he announced to the entire audience, if you are under the age of 30 here, you are a loser. I need you to leave. <laughs> And the reason why he said this, and he made it clear, he goes, you should be getting out of your mother's house, getting in the best shape of your life, and exercising basic life skills and monetizing them. Then you can care about philosophy and religion and politics. But other than that, you're playing Dungeons and Dragons. And that is the same thing you see when you see these women's march, when you see the BLM marches. They're simply these privileged losers mm -hmm. who have never had to – deal with any suffering. So it's much easier to cerebrally be here and go on the streets and just start just basically play, play the blame game, right? And feel this do-gooders high. But then you have to go home and actually work on yourself and lose 30, 40 pounds. You know what I mean? It's, it's easier to do that. Uh, and, and I think that that's a big part of the reason why I believe every artist, and I tell this to my community too, every artist, you should be working out. Because it's all connected, man. And the Telegraph in the United Kingdom, they're not the most biased. They're pretty good. The Telegraph did a study with 300 men 
um, and they actually measured their grip strength and upper body strength. 150, uh, 150 men who voted for lower taxation and lower support of welfare and government programs, and then they, the 150 men who voted for higher taxation and higher support of welfare. And the first thing they noticed were all these men that voted for lower taxation had a stronger upper body strength or they were all in physically better condition. And that tells you a lot because I bet you, I bet you all these fucking white knight pussies on the streets that are beta males trying to get their dicks wet by, by apologizing about being men. If they just ate some steaks and squats and stopped making excuses, <laughs> I bet you they would realize, Oh, I already feel better. I don't even want to be here. I have better things to do. They're not taking care of their local, you know, Jordan Peterson, clean your room. Mm -hmm. They're not taking care of their local level. So it's so easy to go out there and, and be ephemeral because you're not, at, you're not, you're not going to get in. You're not in, you're not in harm's way by doing that. How about you have some gonads, you work on yourself and then you can earn that mandate. You go from the inside out. People look at a fountain, you know, it, why are we looking at the externalities? It's the inner source. You have to work on yourself. And then you can speak about everything. Uh, and this is what I was taught as a child. And I kept my mouth shut for a while. There's a reason why I, kept, I was in social camouflage. It wasn't necessarily because I was a total bitch. It's because I, was, I felt, man, let, let, let me listen before I speak. But I dealt with so much shit now that I got a lot piled up. I'm going to speak my mind about this issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's, great. that's good i mean everybody needs to speak up i mean that's why i'm here yeah, on good this. good men have to speak up that's the only reason why things are this bad because good men the good men listening here you got to speak about some way one way or the other i understand that you can get into like i under like i spoke i i love waking men up i love waking the men up because when men truly are masculine the world's going to be more peaceful you know it's counter to a lot of people what people think they think masculine means we're simply going to compete and punch each other in the face and be aggro with testosterone. That is not true. The men, the absence of masculinity is what is toxic because the men who do not have masculinity are the ones who cheat on their wives, abuse their partners, backstab their loyalty of friends, and they don't believe themselves to be allies with other men in war. They're the ones who lack masculinity because they're not able to hold their word. They don't understand the structural integrity of the boundaries and holding themselves to, to accountability. So when masculinity truly is, is, is geared up, there will be more decency, more civility, more benevolence. And this is why I'm, I'm philosophically it makes sense if you take it to its logical conclusion, you know? So I'm, I'm all about trying to get men to be as strong as they can, dial it to 10 and to make epic art and influence the next generation. <laughs> that's the move yeah. you know yeah. what let's even go back now i want to talk about your art specifically okay now backstage we had talked about this and i said there was a couple artists that reminded when i saw your art for the first time there's two artists specifically the first one is picasso that's the first artist that came to mind when i saw your work the second one is leroy neiman so i don't know if anybody in the chat or anybody watching this I'm sure everybody is familiar with Picasso and I'm not sure if you're familiar with that art style, but then also it was the colors that really I saw. And it brought me back to my younger days of Leroy Neiman because of those bright, vivid colors. Cool. Now I wrote something down here. When I look at your art, okay. What I see in some of it is I'm seeing kind of like geometric shapes almost some of it looks how do i say like pixelated or pixels that's my interpretation yeah. of what i'm seeing and i did mention to you earlier that there was one specific painting that you did was all in everything so anybody watching you can look up look online whatever and there's a specific painting called all in everything by arthur that was the painting to me that I still can look at it and find something different. I know that's a lot of questions I just put at you right there, but you know, let's start yeah. with Picasso and Leroy Neiman. So let's talk about your art style because that's sure. what I saw. So, so, so Neiman, um, 
he his color combinations and his approach to color and his gestural mark making both of those qualities sort of pays this oblique tribute to phobism and this is something that I've, I have also done because I am a student of art history. My thing is uh, very Bruce Lee, you know, not to uh, work the slanted eyes to my favor. Mm -hmm. But uh, the idea that you want to keep what's useful and what can benefit your style and you want to reject that which is not useful. And the first thing you'll notice is I pretty much rejected every single postmodern artist. Uh, none of their stuff is useful. It's all vague, miasmic, and there's nothing useful to it. Explain, but, explain postmodern. What does that mean for somebody who wouldn't know? Any, basically, the, the artists who are rejecting all traditional pedagogical techniques. Okay. And, and their notion is that it's like when these crazy Marxists say that we're going to vaguely transcend history and create utopia on Earth. Mm -hmm. Rather than we're going to learn from history so that we don't need to repeat un, you know, unnecessary uh, struggles because we can learn from our ancestors. You know, David Horowitz talks about there's two ways to learn from history, either, either by understanding what our ancestors went through so we can appreciate where we are, or you vaguely have this notion of being the chosen people, vanity and narcissism. We're the ones who are going to take us to this next level. Um, it's very, it's, it's actually uh, very narcissistic again. And I think when you look at postmodern art, they're doing the same thing. They're looking at all these traditions of classical traditions. I mean, look, I always tell people, don't go to galleries. If you really want beautiful art, if you want a beautiful experience, don't go to galleries, go to museums. Mm -hmm. If you want to see beautiful art, go to museums. You know, we'll go ABC, go look at the Greeks. Their statue, oh my God, their sculptures are amazing. Go look at um, the European master painters, the Dutch painters, or the French. You don't have to go to the galleries. I mean, there's galleries who do it right, but generally speaking, if, if I'm going to give up the most likelihood of a person having a good time, they want to experience some beautiful art, I tell them to go to a museum, as long as it's not... Um, Brooklyn Museum or um, uh, LACMA, all this postmodern crap. Um, yeah, so, so, so my style, it does have a lot of impressionism, but I'm basically stacking everyone that has inspired me and has touched my heart. You know, a lot of impressionists. There's elements of Gustav Klimt, Art no, or, um, a lot of the ancients. But that's all the formalism aspect. There's formalism, color theory, mark making, drawing, painting, and then there's contextualism. That's the content. What is the subject matter that resonates with you? What is interesting you? And to me, it's the religious. To me, the religious has always been attractive to me. And I'm speaking as a person who was an absolute atheist. I was a part of this new atheist fad. I believed that I was an intellectual looking down on people unconsciously. It was pathetic. I was not aware that, um, and again, not everyone had this journey. I'm only speaking for myself. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I really want to come from a place of respect. So, so when I say I was being foolish, I mean I was being foolish. Because, um, again, I want to make that clear. Uh, but my whole thing is that even as an atheist, I, there's two things. One's a psychological framing. Psychologically, I couldn't deny that, like, I just wasn't satisfied with atheism, you know, it just, it, it was, it was not an enriching perspective for me that this is a fully automatic model of the universe and morality is what you can get away with, not what's the right thing to do. I didn't like that sentiment. Wow. I wanted, what was that? Say that one more time. Yeah. I, I mean, when you're an atheist, you're unconsciously telling yourself that there's no spiritual transcendent morality. And because there's there, that standard isn't there, it's your morality is based on what you can get away with it's not based on what is the right thing to do there's because you're looking at yourself as a final arbiter you're going to go based on your hedonistic biological pleasures you're going to go by, by your impulses you're not going to go based on the standards of a god or you know a universality or the logos you're not going to go you're not going to point in that direction it's not going to happen and 
Secondly is because even as an atheist, and this is going to explode, I'm going to be more vulnerable here. Even as an atheist, every time I paint it cathartically doing what I want in a private space in my studio by myself, I'm going to paint what I want that resonates with me. I was always painting the religious. And I, I was like, why is it that the religious aesthetics are always the most attractive to me? You know why? Because it truly holds the most important part of beauty. The highest form of beauty is the sacred, right? And if you look at like what our society is built off of, it's reason, the good, truth, and beauty. And beauty is one of those pillars. So I was attracted to the reality that the most highest form of beauty is sacred, transcendental uh, aesthetics. You know, this idea that there's something higher that loves you. You know, that's, that's a beautiful sentiment, just that sentence. So that's kind of my style in this uh, long-winded personal rant. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's good. I, I, that's, that's why you're here, because we want to hear what you have to say. Now, I want to go back to uh, my, my the, your painting that stood out the most to me. And it's that painting, it's called All and Everything. And am I saying that right? All and everything. Yeah, it's it's, it's a very uh, 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 bold statement. <laughs> There's a lot going on there. So yeah, that's why I did that. Yeah. Every time I look at it, I see something different. I I I notice a different part of it. That's that's me. That's what I've when I have looked at that. Even last night when I was looking at it, I'm like, all right, I saw something I didn't see last week in that painting. Now that painting, I believe has some didn't it win an award if i'm correct that yeah that was one of the works um that won me artist of the year so i i'm a two-time artist of the year award winning recipient one in the dmb dc Maryland, virginia and one in new york city and uh that was a part of the body of work that i produced when i was in the eileen s kaminsky family foundation residency and this woman is a very influential figure in the new york art world She's not a wokey. Um, that's why I'll pledge her name proudly here. Mm -hmm. But my, my whole, but yeah, that is a painting that one of those paintings in my career that I'm truly proud of. Every artist has a couple of those where they think, I don't know how to explain it. It's like, you know, some people call it flow, you know, that notion of flow mm -hmm. or my, one of my masters, he says, he calls it mojo. It's like, you know, when your mojo is there, Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there's different words for it and another one of my mentors he calls it peak performance like when this, the day feels right and of course you know these techniques but something is just right and it's all coming out so perfect and, and you can say is it random it's not random I can render a head proportionally and capture the values and make it three dimensional and add vibrant colors to it but sometimes it just comes out perfectly mm -hmm. and um that sounds mad presumptuous. It's not, it, not that it's perfect, but it's a work I'm very proud of. It's one of my uh, most challenging competitions that I accomplished. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, I love that one. It stood out to me. I mean, I rejected I was, so many, so many, like I had a collector in Paris who wanted it. I rejected them. A collector in Japan who wanted it. I said, no, I want to keep this piece. I've already sold two pieces that were so good for my career that I ended up actually getting offered way more money later and they were already sold to anyways. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's one of those things, you know, like, you know about how, how quickly the value can increase if you're mm -hmm. um, kicking it in the game. <laughs> yeah. So le let me ask you another question. Do you do commission work? I do a lot of commission. Okay. I only do commissions for either conservative or religious men. I know that sounds weird, but I seriously only do that. Because I only, I only want to, like, if I'm going to dedicate myself, you know, I'm mean, not that they have to be religious, but men who understand the deeper cause. And then I don't need to pay anything crazy for them. It doesn't have to be this thing. It could be, it could be hey, you know, I want you to paint me and my dog. That's fine, but I'm going to do it in my own style. Okay. Because they're the ones who are going to really appreciate my work down the line. You know, because the language that this aesthetic decision-making I work so heartily to have as my language and style was built from my appreciation of spirituality and 
my conservative principles actually that's where that's where it actually comes from it's a symbolic excavation of these ideas so i'm telling you that in regards to art appreciation i just want the customer to be happy so if the collector gets this work i want them to be always looking at that and thinking that is a that that is that's the move you know that's what you want <laughs> I'm curious on a painting like that. How long does it take to do something like that? And how big is that original? Oh, the original all and everything, that's like six feet, six feet wide. Um, I think and five foot tall. It's a, it's a more wide than tall. But mm -hmm. you know, that that painting, it's funny because if you look at it carefully, now that you've been watching it, the top region are all these celestial figures, things that should be protected. Right, archetypal things that should be protected. So we have angels, you know, deities, um, pure figures, purity. You know, it could be children, things that we have to protect. The middle, notice n nothing here is done randomly. The middle, there's is all these different warriors, guardians, protectors, different mythological figures that are of the good and protecting and preservation. They're all in this middle area. The bottom is the underworld. That's where we have the Slavic Phoenix at the bottom. It represents going back up. And there's okay. all these different primordial creatures coming out. We have death, Yamantaka from, from Hindu culture, all these underworld figures. Um, and that's that separation is very important. You know, and, and I think that's a lot of what you talk about masculinity right we, we need to a lot of men today this painting makes me think of something uh, it makes me think of a lot of different philosophical messages because this is a painting that took me several months oh okay wow that's so, what yeah, no yeah this painting took me a long time wow um I, I mean there's a lot of detail in it a lot of small brush strokes that people can see too but one thing it makes me think of with the explanation I shared, one of the things it makes me reflect upon is how, you know, the men today, you know, if, if the Mongols were headed to us over here, they'd probably go running with the women and children. And I think there's something missing where men used to have a greater mandate. And I think the martial art and the fact that my father is like this veteran, tough guy, old school alpha male, I think that sort of context whipped me in shape, but I do notice a lot of the men that I grew up with, my peers and my, my, my friends, my, my age group, they're, um, they're pussies. They're mm -hmm. pussies. You know, the, the reality was those Mongol motherfuckers are coming this way. The women children go this way and we go this way. That was the deal. That's a part of being a man. But now they're saying, no, men are going their own way. And I get it. Women today are incredibly toxic and they don't deserve... They don't deserve good men, actually. They don't deserve it. They absolutely do not. But I think that it's important to also understand that we need to collectively as men agree to condition women properly so that they, we can go back into the traditional sentiment because it's only going to get worse. The circling of the drain is going to get faster with the way things are going with social media and the accessibility of having an echo chamber internet. and. Mm -hmm the self-absorbed culture, it's, it's only going to get worse. And I know for a fact that the wisdom of the past is going to be the thing that fixes it. And um, that's why I paint all the, everything old, new, with the new painting materiality and color theory. You know, I get a lot of young people contacting me saying like, wow, like I really like the colors you're using. It's so vibrant, it's so wild, it's exploding my face crazy. And then I just planted a seed in their head because this kid is now using his, this imagery as their wallpaper on their phone. But they're looking at, you know, a Buddha and then a cross in the back every day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I did that to a lot of people. Yeah. Now, I'll even back up a little farther. You said when you do something, you said it's intentional. So when you say it's intentional, so when you go to, when you go to do a painting, do you just all of a sudden, this is what I want to paint? Do you already have, as an artist, do you already have a picture of it in your mind finished or does it evolve as you're painting? So I have like stacks of sketchbook that probably go up to my chest. And uh, I do a lot of drawing. 
drawing is your greatest supporter for any art. I gotta say, every I, I think drawing should be mandatory to be honest, because it helps your observation skills. But I do so much drawing, and I'm usually inspired, honestly, most more by reading, and that's something that surprises people. I do a lot of reading, so I'll be reading nonfiction, philosophy, psycho, psycho um, well, I don't want to say psychology because I don't know if Young, Young is a defector in the same way I'm a defector of the Freudian school, mm -hmm. but we'll call it, uh, because he believed in this, you know, he, he, people find him so taboo because his theories are not grounded in materiality. So it, it often implies like, oh, what are you talking about spirituality? But yes, he is. <laughs> um, uh, but a lot of, a lot of young too, yeah. But just these very deep men who are articulate and they were visually oriented, they inspire me a lot. I read their stuff and I just get excited and they give me goosebumps. They give me goosebumps when I write and when I'm just in awe of like, wow, this makes complete sense. And, and I feel like there's something emblematic towards, towards the truth and something corrective. And I think, okay, I want, I want to paint this. It feels right. But then I do a lot of sketching. And the sketch is similar to the painting, how it turns out finally. But it's never that mechanically precise. It's always a little bit of an adventure where like I have, it's like, this is what I want to do. I want it to be a triangle, but the base ends up being maybe a little smaller or bigger. And you know what I mean? It's like, there's always things. But I know I want to draw this Buddha here. I know I want to draw this bitten apple over here. Like I know what I want to do and I sketch it and I, and I got the positioning and the essence of what I want, but it doesn't always turn out exactly it. Um, so yeah, but there's a lot of planning, you know, I, I, I have my methodology, but it's always different. It's always different because the subject matter changes. Um, and what I'm reading changes. Okay. Now that, that painting all and everything, I have this vision of it. I've watched it a few times, but I see, I'm still seeing, I want to say there's a face in my memory in the middle of the painting. Hmm. What what am I remembering? Probably probably Caligula. Okay. Um, he's there. I mean, of course. I, I mean, I, I mean, it's, it's hanging right over here, brother. Okay, there you go. There it is. That's it. Okay, good. I love this one, man. Again, like I, I'm gonna hold off selling this piece. This is my baby. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is Caligula here. Um, I was really fascinated about the Roman emperors and how you know the the notion of the high chair tyrant. Like there is these people who are given all these pow this power. Now that's without, the original, right there. Am I looking at the original? This is the original. Okay. Wow. Okay. One and only, man. Yeah. This, this, this is this is the one that the international collectors want. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, that's awesome, man. I'm glad I get to see the original. Oh yeah, now, I mean, I'm hanging a lot of my art up. Uh, this is my studio. You're in my studio right now, you know. So I I always come in here and, and all the arts here ready to go, man. Just um, um, look look. If there's young artists listening, you gotta paint. You gotta paint. You know, I get like young artists contacting me saying, "Hey, how are you getting six solos in a year? Like, how is that possible? You get one solo in a year, you're doing really well." Um, and, and I'm like, I always tell them, um. The first question I ask, especially if they're under like 22, 23, I always say, how many hours a week do you paint? And they always say, oh, you know, like eight to 10. Okay, well, listen, I paint beyond nine to five. I paint beyond nine to five every day. I wake up early to go paint. <laughs> so you need the inventory and, and you need to develop your voice. Like I've, I've, I've done well beyond 10,000 hours, man. So my whole thing is that like, if you want to be in a position as an artist where you have a nice studio, you know, you got to, you know, and you, you know, you have multiple setups going and you have like, also like when I talked about the solos I had, that was when I was with the galleries, you know, at that time, that's when the kid contacted me. But like, now I'm completely independent, you know, I don't like, I'm, I'm selling on my own now. 
But to get to get to that position, you should be panning your ass off. Like that's just the bottom. You should be panning your ass off. <laughs> you know, it's like if you're gonna go to some judo competition, brother, and then oh, you're yeah. just like you're like, why did why won't you let me? You know, give me the you know, you should at least give me silver. Yeah. And yeah. you know, it's like I should have done two hundred more jukomis that night I was oh, training. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. That's, that's funny you say that because i you know when you say martial artist and artist so so now i i relate more to what you just said through your art and through martial arts so i understand that that i'm completely relating to how you set up your painting now i understand it a whole lot more than i did before we started i mean tony tell me tell me if you agree there's no better feeling than you go to the mat and you put in your hours and you're training with someone else and it's like you want to apply this technique and you're going to see if it works and you do it and boom it lands perfectly and you're like you you hear the harp you know what i mean it's like and and and, and you had a great practice and you're in great shape because you've conditioned it so you feel that i've earned it feeling and you're and you're walking out of the you're walking out of the dojo your feet are dragging but it's like that good feeling because you know you did damage mm -hmm. like you're like okay i I can die now. Like this is great yeah. feeling. That that high, yeah. That's called discipline, you know, because because it's very important for especially young people. Honestly. My mother told me this when I was young, but uh, um, which is it's it's interesting because she's a pianist and and she plays cello too. She said, "Kwon, Kwon's my name in Korean." She goes, "Kwon, there's two types of pleasure in the world. There's a physical pleasure of good food." time with a woman intimately you know there's all these different types of physical pleasures which are all there and they're to be enjoyed but there's a pleasure even higher than this which is assertion of a discipline developing skill and pride of an ability from hours and building it up and i'll tell you right now it's like you see some kid at some festival who's dancing by himself because he's high out of his mind on acid you just see a crazy guy dancing, but in his head, he's seeing he's seeing beauty and life and and light come into his whole existence. Well, guess what? If you have a discipline and skill enough, and you're in your studio by yourself, people think, okay, he's just going off to paint. But no, what I'm what's going on here is a life's work, and it clicks. So there's there's these invisible pleasures that aren't as sexy as externalities, but that's the stuff that gives spice to life. And it's really important. That's why like, I get so much joy trying to get men to get into that creative flow. Like, I really believe every man should be exercising some kind of materiality or creativity because, um, man, like my uncle is a great example. He made so much money in Korea working corporate, but he discovered his love of woodworking building beautiful chairs and tables, staining it, sanding it. Beautiful. Whenever I visited the wood shop, the, the, just the angle of the chair, and, and he, it's so beautifully done, and he gets more pride in that than anything else. And, and I'm glad he found something. Uh, and it shouldn't be looked at from the perspective of fear of missing out, anything like that. It's not, uh, there's no us against them in this. It's just I'd recommend it because you get a new anchor of joy and appreciation once you have something creatively. It's cathartic, you know. It's like yoga. It's like you, like it's, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know? Do you, how how would you how would you act, like tell a guy to to say embrace his artistic side? In other words, can I? How would you encourage a man to go ahead and he knows. He knows in his heart, in his mind, that he wants to, whether it be build something or try to paint something, not to be discouraged with your, say, your first result. Because, we're, you know, we're in a society of quick results, instant. We need it now. We That's want it now. We want food. So when you told me that painting took six months to do, so that was a, I mean, that's a... That's a work of art. I mean, there's there's the definition of a work of art. Oh, yeah. It wasn't overnight. You put time into it. Mm -hmm. So how do you get a guy who's going to be discouraged at his first try and say, you know what? I'm no good at this. 
Is it? Well, well, I, I, I would like to. Yeah, exactly. It is a mental thing. First, I want to break this down by first explain the process of appreciating the artist. Hey, Gator, what's up? <laughs> so, uh, the first thing is that in order to even approach that, it requires a certain amount of confidence. So, it's almost like you want to um, clear your lens first. Like, if you're gonna, if like you need to first dismantle the pretentious elitism associated with, you know, art making. Because there's there's this um man look look at all these uh, artistic names Gator Paint Primal <laughs> Da Vinci beautiful <laughs> hey gentlemen let me introduce you this is this is my regular panel guys this oh cool 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 Primal Man Gene um, I want to introduce you to Arthur Kwan Lee and Gonzo he is our resident artist I was telling you about oh back beautiful today. man I love yeah. it love it brother oh. that's what I'm talking about man yeah that's awesome. And, uh, both these guys are artists in their own rights, for sure. And Gonzo, I think, is an incredible artist. Um, wow. he's, done, he's done some stuff live before, which I thought was really cool. So, what kind of what kind of paintings do you make, brother? Muted. Oh yeah. Oh, you're muted. I thought you was like, oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's cool. My man Primal looks like the Greek god of Thor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to meet Primal Man. There you go. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. Are we working now? Yeah. yeah we're good. Perfect. Sounds good. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So he asked you, Gonzo, I mean, yeah. tell him about what type of art that you do because I, I love your artwork. I mean, you know, since the first day, I'll tell you, Arthur, real quick, is the first time I found out about Gonzo's art is one of one of the shows that we did on Saturday night. And we call it Saturday night, get it off your chest. And Gonzo sketched the whole night about everything we were talking about. And awesome. um, and then he sent it to me. And it's it's like super, super cool. So that's awesome. Was it like gestural drawing? I guess you would call it that. Yeah. Cartoony. It's cartoony. Okay, so okay, cool, cool. But I mean, yeah. well, you'll I have, have to show a, me. I have a couple different modes. This is a guitar that I painted, but oh, brother, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so I have kind of two modes. This is sort of my my doodle sort of drawing thing that I've got going on there. But um, other right than on. that, you know, I think all my stuff is just kind of. Do, do you play that thing ever and just shred? <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I, awesome, uh, awesome. Yeah, Very I record cool. some music here and there, but the, uh, um, I think. You know, I don't know. The best way I would put it, my stuff is just kind of disturbing. <laughs> That's just what I would say. Okay. Just kind of macabre sort of thing. Wow, That's... look at that skeleton. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful yeah. work, man. So it's wow. Just, this is my hey, you should, you, should, you should join my community, man. I, I, I started something called the Genesis Council, and, it, and it's actually specifically the, it started because this idea of taking the culture back. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I started this because I, I know too many creative people who are tired of not being able to feel like they, like they feel like they're the only ones who have conservative beliefs mm -hmm. and they're artists, which is not true at all. We're just more civil and we believe in not, you know, bringing it up when we're making art. Like it's, mm -hmm. it, it's really, we're just more respectful people. That's really what it boils down to. But they encroach on you. They encroach mm -hmm. on you and they, they encroach on you. And, you know, they say, oh, you know, I, I had an actor, I spoke to literally like two, three hours before this podcast. And he said, yeah, today we all came in and they were asking for our pronouns so we can put them on our name tag. I was like, <laughs> like, like, are, what the, f like, it's, it's just ridiculous. And uh, so I started this community. At first, it was just to have a bunch of conservative or religious oriented people come together as creatives and support one another. But um, now we're at a point where you know, we're having like book clubs on Young to we're going to have Dr. Kevin Liu, PhD, Jungian professor, who's going to be doing guest lecture for us. He's Jordan Peterson's most famous student. Like all these all these uh, cool learning resources now. And um, yeah, it's just worth looking into. I mean, I, I, I think that we need to take the culture back, you know, for for us to reach some reach some sort of normalcy. You know, it's important. And I take that culture fight seriously. Yeah, I have a yeah. uh, I have a link for that in the description of the video. It's okay, called cool. Genesis. 
what is it called again? The Genesis Gen Council. Council. Okay. Yeah. So, so my man Primal of here, uh, you you gotta be doing something creative with that happening heavy metal beard. <laughs> Yeah, I guess like Tony says, I'm kind of a, I have my own artistic ways, you know? Cool. I, I do, every now and then I'll, I'll pull out a canvas and do some painting, but it's rare. And when I do, I kind of consider myself like a lazy artist, right? I, I have all of these creative ideas just going on. And I gave Gonzo a, a art, a piece of a, an artwork idea, which I, I think to me would be a masterpiece. He might think differently. He might think it's cool or whatever. But to me, oh, it was just was this eye, the the bridge, the spooky oh, bridge. Yes, that's right. Yeah. No, yeah, I the, love that. yeah. The spooky bridge. But anyway, um, I'll get this idea and I'll just put it on a canvas and I'll just go to town with no type of direction of like, you know, shadows, shading. I'm yeah. just putting paint on a canvas. And sometimes. Well, hey, it, it, hey, maybe you should join the phone too, man, because I teach classes in there. Yeah, like I'm, I'm becoming an active like, like, you know, it's funny, like people offer me like universities offer me to teach with them quite a bit. Yeah, I don't want to teach at a university, man. I don't want to go to a LGBTQ meeting afterwards and all that. Like, that's Maybe you happening. should, man. Maybe you should. Maybe they need to have you there. Someone like you there. No, to, let them see, to see some, Co some collateral damage, man. Let them crash and burn. Yeah, Th there's some of that. Maybe I'm being harsh, but, you know, yeah, maybe I'm being harsh. I don't know. <laughs> not at all sometimes you just don't want to deal with it i think being in new york city for this long has you know just made me realize you know like are you guys all in florida no no oh okay yeah we got gonzo's in texas primal man is in new orleans and i'm in florida okay yes. nice we're all yeah, over yeah i'm in new york city with the uh you know and i'm anti-mask anti-vax forever yeah and, same and, and, and I and I get into these, um, you know, my my lady and I were getting kicked out of pretty much everywhere we go to. Mm -hmm. you know, we we go to this one ping pong spot on the weekend so we can play ping pong and drink and just hang out. We walk in there and we just did our usual thing. We usually just check in, go and play, and then the lady comes up and kicks us out. So now we can't go to our spot anymore. Our cafe we go to, we can't go in. Um, they just started implementing this with gyms and. And grocery stores, so it's getting a little disconcerting because you know it, it's crazy. Like the, the sheep is strong here. The sheep is very strong here. It's a mess. It's a mess. It's a mess. I gotta get out of here, guys. I mean, it's like I understand staying put. Hey, guys. What's up, Dark Blade? What's going on? Nothing much. Cool. I like the name. Thanks. Got a samurai in here. I want to uh, invite Michael Foster to come on the panel also. I dropped the link in the chat. So oh, beautiful. if anybody wants to talk, come on and talk to uh, Arthur, come on. Yeah, on. I, I, Michael, I love you, man. I appreciate what you're doing, brother. Yep. So Michael I'm a Foster. film studies person, by the way. Oh, cool. Beautiful. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, we got to make film great again. It's just the, the whole thing is just, is just bringing it back to. Um, the classics essentially and and having a place for especially you three white toxic men <laughs> you're gonna oh, public wait, enemy number one wait and i gotta play something that you just you just sparked it right here here we go i, I <laughs> play it let me find it let me find it uh where is it here we go i should have got a cigar oh, wow. we need a white boy yep 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 yeah, you went there. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Come on. on. <laughs> yeah, I had the rose bean himself. <laughs> hey, you That's know what? Rose, bud. That's some good, vid there, good video quality, too. Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, I, I really blew that up. But I will play this one from our favorite real quick because I always play a couple, couple clips. And I know, Arthur, <laughs> you will relate to this in a big way. And I'm just going to play it real quick. A lot of people are like retarded. They're like, they can't comprehend. You know what I'm saying? They are like absolutely retarded. I saw a situation yesterday and the situation was, was, was handled by adults, but in a retarded way. <laughs> That's a man after my own heart. 
<laughs> we all love Jesse here. Every, everyone, everyone loves Jesse. I mean, it's you know, even like it's funny, like even people that go on to debate him, like apparently a lot of them are like, I don't agree with anything he says, but he's really likable. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Everyone likes Jesse, you know, and, and also it's like, you know, you met you met Jesse Tony. Um, hey, Michael, what's up, brother? Yo yo. What's up? I checked out your I checked out your art today. Oh, cool! Awesome Appreciate stuff. It. Good stuff. Oh, thank you, my good man. You, you know, uh, when when I I remember when I first met Jesse, it's like I feel like he lives in his gut. You know, he doesn't do any of the intellectual circle jerk BS. Yeah, that's a that's a good way to put. It. I liked it. By the way, I liked your definition of art. I liked it. Yeah. Yeah, Tony caught me off guard. It's such a large question to ask. It is. You know. Do you like the Hildebrand brothers? Do you know who they are? Hildebrand brothers. That sounds very familiar. You might, uh, let me look this up really quickly. They work in acrylics, much like at least it looks like acrylics to me. Very similar art style, a different a different application. But I was I was appreciating your brush strokes. I thought they were really good. It's just really cool stuff. Thank you, man. Hildebrand yeah. brothers here. And uh, soon again, I, w- I want you to I want to see the, my favorite painting by you. Oh, wow, and everything I. That the original behind you, I, I really want to see that again, and I want to yeah. I want to put it up on the big screen here so everybody can see this. Sure. Yeah. Let, uh, let me uh put that up there. Wow, that's amazing. That is mind blowing to me because, like I said, there was an image in the middle, and obviously, the image in the middle is what really jumped out at me. Now. Arthur, you said that's Caligula, correct? That is Emperor Caligula, yes. Yeah. That is just incredible to me. I'm 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 really stoked to see the original. Oh man, hey, uh, why not? It's here. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. is just incredibly beautiful. Thank you, man. That's the one that that's the one that jumped out at me. And looking through all your artwork, that one just just hit me in the face. And I've looked at it again last night, and I'm like, that's just incredible i mean gonzo what do you think of something like that like painting as an artist yourself what do you think i mean six months in on something like that so what's thinking, your... what a loser no <laughs> no it's it's real craftsmanship because i gotta oh, say you. like the um and i was really like relating to uh what y'all were talking about earlier with uh kind of mass media and uh you, you know all just basically all art you got film and and tv and movies and uh, art in general and it's just a real mess um i you know I, like lately i've been reading this uh this short story collection i've been listening to this short story collection it's from the 80s and i feel like this was um you know obviously this uh kind of this postmodernist sort of stuff was around before even then but um i feel like it was really starting to break through at this point and of course everybody's still talking about the cold war and that sort of stuff in vietnam and these uh this guy dennis etchison he edited a book called cutting edge and i've been, just been listening to these stories man and some of them are very good um but the rest of them it's like they go nowhere and they do nothing and this is what i see with a lot of uh, a lot of stuff these days a lot of art a lot of, a lot of stories a lot of movies music it kind of just goes nowhere and it does nothing and there's no standard. Um, yeah, you know, you know, the, the universality for any type of art making, and this is whether whether it's dancing or, you know, painting, whatever it is, is that you need to learn the rules to break the rules. Mm-hmm. The problem with people who are making art today, especially at art universities, they're not learning the fundamentals. They're not even learning, like you'll get a better, you know, if you look at the 1800s, our education was like any other trade school, like an atelier school. You go in, you study under somebody who knows the techniques, and they pass them down to you. But well, art universities are something, they're a completely different monster. And I, and I did. That's I did, extremely I did, true. Yes. I, I, I went into this road, and they're telling me how, like, how are you going to, how is your work going to be social justice oriented? You know, and I'm like, well, at that time, I was not even political. So I, I always tell people that I was pushed to the right because I was really interested in you know my love of painting it was very much uh like a video game no no it's like it's like i'm i'm, I'm making art i'm making art i'm not i don't have a radio show i'm not 
I don't have a platform. I'm making art. This is a solo thing. And as I'm doing this, they keep projecting and inflating these weird identity politic notions in university. And I get to a point where the gallery scene is even worse. <laughs> and you go, all right, you know what? I'm not surprised. Yeah, it's, it's even worse. <laughs> I know from a film side how bad it's getting pretty bad. Like, you can't even tell a story anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the problem with the left. They're, they're ruining beauty. You know, if you look at the peak, the highest peak, I'm going to speak for, for painting at least, it's Christian art. Why? Because of the expectation set, right? It, it was very clear that if you're going to be a painter during that period, you have this training and it was rigid and it, and it, it almost feels like, you know, it, it, it felt so demanding when you read the history of it. But the reason is because once you have that, you can take it to the next level and honor the people who taught you. They don't do that now. What do they do? <laughs> you have to take um, uh, cultural appropriation classes. I took a class called Dark Side of Your Mind. Is I'm that like, what they call it? Cultural nice. appropriation? No, I, 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 took, I took a class called Dark Side of Your Mind. And I thought it was going to be, okay, maybe we're going to look at the unconscious or inter yeah. interpretation of dreams, something of that. No, it was um, like recognizing your unconscious biases and yep. whatever. And, and apparently I'm adjacent white, my fellow white brothers here. <laughs> what year did you graduate college, Arthur? Uh, 2014. Wow. I did the whole thing. And I was like, hold on, Mike, am I doing this because of my, my, my roots of, uh, you know, my Ching Chong eyes? Or am I doing this because I'm, no, I mean, because, you know, my family is still kind of, um, like, during, you know, my, my father's generation, education was an education, you know, but, but he's still, he's such an old school stubborn guy that he sometimes thinks that, like, you know, I'm telling him that art universities are not what you think they are. You know, they're anti-American. Mm -hmm. Do you like Fuji, uh What's his name? What is that guy's name? I feel like I should know this. Uh, Fujimura? Oh, the wave? M yeah, Makoto Fujimura. He's like... Uh, well, why yeah, would cool. you ask him that question? Isn't that racist? Just kidding. <laughs> I think he's a well-known well Christian artist. Okay. Um it's it's pretty abstract though. I don't like abstract art. I I, I don't like abstract art. I mean, I, I, there's abstract artists I like, but you'll there notice that. Well, you'll notice that they're applying principles that are that are based on traditional techniques, though. Yes, like, 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 it's important to recognize that. Like at the end of the day, you know, I was just telling this to Tony. I don't know if you caught this, but it's worth noting because, you you know, as as a minister, this is, you know, it's it's so true that like. The highest form of beauty is the sacred. And shouldn't you be using your brush as, you know, I, you know, the greatest artists actually, when they were painting, they regarded themselves as spiritual servants. Mm -hmm. They did, you know, it's like, you're doing this for reverence. And it's really, it's a strange thing. When you look at the art today, it's all about, it's, it's a me generation thing. You know, I did, yep. I did an art show in Art Basel in 2019 at, uh, at the Scope Art Show. This is a nice show, right? It's really well funded, big space. And I painted like all these historical Greek figure statues, big, beautiful paintings. And the art, the two artists I was next to were feminist artists. And one artist, she like shoved these tampons in a teacup and hung them as an insulation. And I'm like, Ugh. okay, this is this is like you have to ask yourself, what is the cultural value? And there is none. And, and it ultimately, guys, you know, um, all of this stuff. That's being pushed, you know, the politically correct culture. Again, politically correct culture is what's ruining the art world because political correctness is not just a way to silence masculinity because the attack on conservatism is really attack on masculinity. The political correct culture is ultimately a supporter of relativism. That's really the problem. And relativism is the notion that, <laughs> that, that the Pieta, they're calling the Pieta, that stupid rock at the LACMA. They're saying the Pieta is at the same caliber as I'm, I'm sorry, uh, um, um, the levitated mass. They're saying the levitated mass is at the is our generation's version of the Pieta, and I'm like, this says everything. This is everything, you know. Someone here just said art is subjective, and 
art is not subjective. Like there's an aspect of it, but there's a perfect way to strike a C chord. And there is a there is a great way there's a there's a beautiful swing in baseball there are, like there's a level of it but beauty there are objective factors to beauty that uh, yes. are, are that everyone appreciates and the problem with a lot of modern art is you bring the meaning to it right that's the problem. Right. Mm -hmm. So even you can have very abstract art, but it's teaching you the beauty of colors, the beauty of space, the beauty of contrast, all that sort of stuff. That, and that's taking you outside of yourself and making you consider things. That's good. It's making you consider the world. It, it, and sometimes it's down to a very a basic level there uh, at Cincinnati um, Art Museum. We go there every once in a while. It's got some abstract stuff that's uh, you look at it and you're like, this is beautiful. It makes me think about something other than myself. Modern art is narcissistic to its core. It's all about you bring the value to it. And the, the artist does, it was like Tolkien talked about the power of fiction. The power of fiction is not that you escape the world, but you're able to present the reality of the world in a... Um, context that will actually make you think about it and consider it right and a good artist is helping you see things that exist that you've been missing so you're here let, let, let me ask you a question though what what i might think is horrible art somebody else might think is great art you know why because because the sta um the, the those standards are living under the prism of normalized decadence. So they're, they're looking at it from a prism. You know, how many times have you spoken to a radical and you're not even having a conversation with them? They're looking at you through a psychological frame. They're this tunnel vision, right? That's the same thing with art. Look, there is, I'm not, you know, there are cultural differences to beauty and all. I understand all that. But earlier I, I, was, I was sharing that beauty by definition are, object or identifiable boundaries that are refined to a high degree you know that's why um I, I i mentioned look at a bodybuilder boom look at a beautiful car we need we need you need to show me that there's um uh those lines need to be set up clearly it, it really does um most famous art is a portrait of a person's face all right there you go. <laughs> That's it. Well, there's such Tony. Tony, are you telling me that the most ugly woman on the world is true beauty to someone else? I mean, the, the reality is that even with it's so not, we, it's not true beauty. No, I don't oh, think. Oh yeah, but I think yeah, you're right. So that to, to Arthur's yeah. So I don't think that. I don't think that. Do I think somebody will fight? can find her beautiful absolutely does that mean but do we have a vision of of our mind and a standard on what is beautiful and what isn't i think we do but i think it is everybody has their own idea and i think art there's certain types of art that that i would like that michael foster might not like i might go to a museum and say okay that does nothing for me where you might say, okay, that's, you know, like, again, I'll go back to, to Arthur's painting of all and everything that, that painting is like, it's, it's basically burned in my mind. And like, when I talked to him earlier without that, it was the, the, I can, I start with the figure in the center and everything works out for me in that, when I look at that painting and I've looked at it so many times to where I see something different every time. And to me, that's that's really what drew me to that painting. I thought it was just so interesting. Every time I look at it, I, and I've looked at it probably a dozen times, I see something different. So, uh, so, so long as we don't make the tail wag the dog, then yeah, absolutely. I, I, I see what you're saying in regards to interpretation, but uh, we have to go with um, whatever general statements are made. You got to go with the what is it called? I think it was called lexicographical method. You have when you see when you want to move on, you need to first wrap up the situation prior to it to move on by looking at the generality to move the conversation forward. And generally speaking, we have to go with those beauty standards 
and we, there are objective standards. And uh, but but for sure, you know what you like about a painting, maybe uh, you know, primal there will hate. <laughs> I don't know, but generally speaking, yeah. If you don't send it to Gonzo, yeah. <laughs> what the? No chalk for Gonzo. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't get it. <laughs> No beans for you. No beans, yeah. No beans. I'm too gator right now. Yeah, um, uh, Gonzo, on one of your streams, I believe you did an actual, you did a chalk drawing, and it was pretty dark. It was a pretty oh, it's dark. Charcoal. It's charcoal, yeah, I think. But yeah. that's what I'm saying. You did a charcoal. Charcoal is really nice. Yeah, charcoal. I call it a charcoal painting, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but um, I love using charcoal. It, mm-hmm. was, it was pretty dark. So I'm going to ask Gonzo a question as an artist. Mm-hmm. Is when you're doing art, is that kind of a window to to kind of what's in your mind or into your soul? Because when somebody draws something or paints something, how deep does it get is my question. How deep does it get? I think it depends. I think it really depends because uh, I'm getting some background noise here. Okay, we're good. Um, I think that's problem. <laughs> okay. Not me this time. I'm not getting it. Okay. It's because it's I think it's gone now. now, so we're good. But yeah, the um, as far as uh, what each, like how how each how far each piece goes, uh, I, it just depends. It's um, there were times I think where I was in uh, a lot of torment, um. And in those times, I w- they, definitely the art would be a, a reflection of that. But some of it, um, some of it is just just an idea. There's no emotion tied to it. And I would say, especially now, uh, that's kind of what it's become for me. There isn't necessarily um, an um, an emotion or um, something really really deep that I'm trying to uh, trying to say in that way. Um, but I, but it, it does depend, like I said. So I think some, some people could probably make the mistake of being like, well, this means this. But, you know, it's kind of kind of more like a Lewis Carroll, like he wrote this, uh, this story sort of as entertainment, you know, for children. And uh, he, he didn't mean anything political or philosophical or anything by it. It was just entertainment. And so I think yeah, that's... You know, Gonzo, uh, if, if, if you, the more technicality you have under your tool belt, the more cathartic it will be. That's the first thing. And it's contrary to what people think about art making. They think it's like, let me just throw paint because it feels good. And then you go, hmm, you must be a liberal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep. it's, it, I, I noticed that it's not about the emotions anymore for me. That's what I've noticed. Um, it's like the love I, of the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like like, a- I, like I was telling Tony before you guys got on, got on I was like, I never understood why um, New York City Antifa put a painter on their list. Like I, I remember when they targeted me and threatened me, I was like, "Why do you? Why do you give a shit?" You know, because I'm not out there f- fighting for the people you're fighting for or anything like that. And it's it's simply because I'm influencing. You know, I still show my work regularly in galleries. People come in and out. And what am I painting? You know, I'm painting religious figures and masculine imagery and tradition. And they don't like that. They don't like the very imagery. So, but in order to even paint those standards, you need to you need to understand the techniques that were they were produced under. So, it just it's it's, it's canonical. It's definitely uh, I would I would recommend you know keep excavating it. But those hand skills you get, it'll t- it'll be a lot more fun. You know, it, it's important to understand when people are. But t- talking about these techniques, it's not like a wagging your finger kind of thing. You know, it's more fun. Mm-hmm. Is that your painting? Nice. <laughs> Fuck on. It's a lot going on. Oh, yeah. Did you do that, Primal Man? Is that you? Yeah. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was like four years ago. Arthur, um, who are your uh, more modern artists that you you kind of enjoy? Like the last couple hundred years. When I say modern, not like very, classical. Very few. Um, Gustav Klimt. Mm-hmm. I like Klimt. 
Um, I like pretty much all the Fovis, although a lot of the Fovis were, you know, I don't mean I don't mean uh, physically, but mentally dirtier people. But anyways, uh, the direction of their brushwork, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate what they're trying to do, and I know this sounds a little strange for a, cur- you know, uh, modern artist to say, but I really look up to the ancients. I know I know you said print in a hundred years, but I don't have too many. I like to a couple hundred years, back. so you know, like yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's hard to come up with. Michael, I like to go way back, you know. Like, Same, but, yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 but 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 for sure, it's um. No, they're there. Uh, I mean, this is going to sound contradictory, but uh, in regards to one of the stages of my painting, the diversity of mark making for the layering, Joanne Michelle, although, um, you know, she's a different brand together, but I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm much more inspired. I'm more inspired by writers, actually, and thinkers. And, and they're they're the ones who often touch me to want to uh, produce art. And um, anyone from film? I mean, I, I, there there's movies that have moved me, but I probably can't name them because I'm not educated like you. You know. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. No problem, no problem. You, you know, I mean, like 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 Braveheart inspired. Like, I know this sounds cliche, but it's such a big movie. But Braveheart, man, like that painting, I'm, I. I that sentiment has moved me to paint. I remember that moment where I was watching Braveheart. And I was like, "Oh my God, this is, makes me want to paint." Hey, hey, Upright Arthur, Warrior. can I call you? Can I just call you Quan? I like that better. Sure, you know, there, guys. Just, yeah, the reason why I did Arthur Quan Lee is because if you look up Arthur Lee, he's like a super famous like drummer or something. You know, I'm not gonna come up. So I'm I have. Just, to- <laughs> I'm just. I'm just gonna call you Quan. I okay, like that that's name. fine. That's fine. Cool. Are you uh, Korean? I'm Korean. I'm American, but yeah, I'm Korean. Yeah, um, I was just wondering because me and Gonzo did an episode on uh, Zen poetry, Zen koan. Oh, wow. And to me, that is, uh, I love Zen poetry. Like, to me, that's good art. Yeah, it, it's, uh, Zen is interesting. I, I mean, um, yeah, Zen is really interesting because the way they get to, like, you need to know the culture of Zen to really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, Me yeah. and Gonzo, I, I introduced everybody to it, and I pretty much was trying to to describe what you just said. You got to sort of have some sort of a, a knack, an ear for it to appreciate it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. You know, uh, Michael, I'm sure you deal with this all the time. From the outside eye, they, they look at this guy. It's like, this guy must be a racist, sexist, bigot, homophobic, his support. <laughs> but then when they when they have the context and, and understand the tremendous weight behind the context they you know they check themselves like it's it's it's, it's like anything else you know you need people's to, um... categories are pretty messed up like for example the uh what i love about koreans is there's more korean presbyterians than pres american presbyterians people don't know that if you've got deep korean roots you know that that there's more uh, the Presbyterian missions for some reason took root really well in Korea. I don't know why, but South Koreans, uh, one of the largest denominations over there is Presbyterians. Where oh, here yeah. in the, where in the oh, states my, where my, my father is a is is a senior pastor. I could tell. <laughs> I could tell. <laughs> I, I I've been I grew up around Cre- uh, Koreans quite a bit, um, and uh, you you can if it wasn't for my if it wasn't for my. Um, you know my, my my Christian background. I think with what I'm with what my the the painting gift that God gave me. If it wasn't for the fact that I had that transcendent morality, I think instead of loving the game of painting, I would have loved myself painting. I really think so, and it's yeah. important that if you are if you have a gift and if you have a talent, like it's very difficult for artists today to understand this but it's very important not to inflate it with your ego yep. it's really not about that it's really not and, and it's going to actually make your art suffer you are you know it's 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 more like it's a waste if you don't if you don't produce it's not because you're this you're this um magnanimous thing just just enjoy it be cathartic about it and it's spread light man that that's always done my thing 
You know, it's um, I just love painting. <laughs> so, what, so what were you saying about Zen, Quan? Um, no, it's, it's you know, I, I I remember reading The Way of Zen when I was in high school by Alan Watts, and I, I you know at that time I was I was uh, ex exploring different perspectives and art history, and you know Zen has a it, it, it sounds so minimalistic and simple, but my favorite Zen story is um, it's like the, like the notion of polar thinking mm -hmm. is really big in Zen. Like every mm -hmm. time a Zen student talks to a Zen master, his whole thing is to flip them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the koans and stories, if you don't understand that sense of polarity, often it seems just like a random, like it seems like you're just reading something simplistic, you know? Like what is the story of Suibi? The 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 um, student goes to the master and says, "Master, what is the secret teaching of uh, Zen Buddhism?" Mm -hmm. And he goes, "Well, meet me when there's no one around later." And then he goes, oh, "Okay, no one else is around." And he goes up to him, he's like, "Master, what is the secret teaching?" And he goes outside and he points at the small stick. He said, "That's a pretty small stick, huh? That's a pretty long stick." And then he woke up. <laughs> There's all these little stories, but the but the polarity of it, it's like it seems like it's going to be the secretive thing, and it was super calm. Or yeah. it's like when or, or 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 when they're cooking, when they're cooking, it seems like they're just genially cooking. And then he goes, uh, uh, "Master, can you hand me a knife?" And he goes, "Which set of knife do you want?" Looks at him seriously, like a yin and yang thing. It's like, oh shit. And then when they're at a temple, it's like very serious moment. And then and then he goes like, um, you know, I. I I should have had another bowl of rice. Like, you know, they're always flipping the students because they're trying to make them non plus. You know, that's just a part of Zen culture. Yeah. And it makes you appreciate the koans and the uh, stories further. But I, love how, I love how these Zen masters could die on command, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, Zen thing is to be like completely chill. That's what Zen <laughs> is. Like, you're chill about everything. And even, even when they, when, when, this Western uh, guy came to see the Zen master. He goes, um, Ma uh, you know, what does it feel like to be this enlightened figure that you have this big following? And he goes, you know, it's like everyday life, but like three inches off the ground. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's kind of their like, like flow. It's interesting. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, um, I'll make it clear though. Like, like I'm, I'm a Christian, but, mm -hmm. but it's funny. And people are like, oh, are you into Buddhist imagery? Because you're Asian? That's like, no, actually, the white boys are the ones who who, who show me the Buddhism. Alan Watson. Yep. And, uh, yeah, it's yeah. funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Uh, it, there, there'd be no gangster rap if it wasn't for a bunch of white 15-year-olds, right? Well, all, all, the, all of the top hip-hop tracks are, like, remakes of of white, you know, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's you know, appropriation. Yeah. I mean, you white hey, boys you don't get enough love. Me, that's, that, that's the real problem. You white boys don't get the love. We need a white boy. <laughs> <laughs> funny, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play my Jew card here, so I get, get a little bit. Oh, there you go. So, hey, I gotta say hey, something real quick. Hey, Quan, was was Alan Watts a beta? It's the real question. He might have been like a blue pill alpha. Okay. You know, you know what I mean. Like, you know, a lot of these like good looking guys who have a lot of girls accessible and they have money, but they're still beta males. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And. and you know, it's important to understand, like, we can talk about, like, like first, like, alpha and beta, you know, young men listening, it's not about the externalities. No one cares about your car or muscles or cool tattoos. That's nothing to do with it. It's just about standing up for what's right. That's the main notion. But, you know, um, I'm sure some of you have heard of R versus K selection theory. That's the most important thing to understanding the realities of alpha and beta. Mm-hmm. So I, I mean, I'm gonna assume he's like a he's like a blue pill alpha because so he's like he's basically like, a, like the like the king of betas maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, because he's so charismatic. He has yeah. all these things that can make him into like a superhero, towards the good. But yeah. You know, um, you know, towards the end of his life, he was a heavy alcoholic, and there's yeah. like dark sides to Watts's um journey. That he seemed like he had a problem with objectivity, didn't he? Yeah, I, that's that's one of the problems with, you know, it's almost psychologically. If I was to just say like, let's say you get, let's say you get like two guys from like a tribe, and you teach one Christianity and one Buddhism, 
without like the uh, the actual metaphysical notion, just psychologically. I mean, they're both gonna believe in like peace and certain sentiments, but the Buddhist is not gonna have like courage. He's not mm -hmm. gonna have like the gonads to stand up for what's right. He's gonna be more of like, well, let's we're gonna let what happens happen. It's you know, and and um, Bill, because they tend to be, they passive. tend towards Brahmin. Right, mm -hmm. that yeah. they don't have to. It's a phil philosophy, but non-doing, non-doing is a whole philosophy in Buddhism. Was the ultimate reality that we're all part of, right? Generally yeah. speaking. Yeah, and let me say, there, there's things I really appreciate about the Eastern religions, and uh, they're also very fun to paint. You know, oh, I used to, I used to be a self-proclaimed Taoist. <laughs> yeah, years ago, Taoism fascinated me a lot, a whole lot. You know, what's fascinating is. Um, a, a fun artist to study is Picasso uh, because how his, as his worldview becomes more narcissistic and self-focused um, his art suffers. Right. So as he moves, yes. so like, you know, you got the blue period, you got his pure uh, cubism, right. Which is really his low art. That's he's most famous for. But as he moves through all that, as he as he loses perspective, as he loses objective points of reality, it res, uh, he, uh, it reflects in his art. And people, I was talking to my co-pastor, and we were talking about what to do. Like we're thinking about like where we have to act culturally right now. And um, he's like, "Look, I don't want to sound gay, but I really think the arts. We have to recapture the arts because they're so important." And it's true because let me give you a great example. If you're a um, if you're a liberal, or if you're a conservative and you're trying to deal with abortion, you're going to say only half a percent of abortions have to do with rape, right? If you're a liberal, what you're going to say is like, this is Jill, and Jill was raped, and she had an abortion, and it was it was hard, but now she's a doctor and she helps other women avoid that and build up their life. Okay, one's data related. The other one's story. Story is more powerful, okay? And this is what conservatives can't get through their hard, retarded heads, right? The power of, of media, the power of story, the power of art moves the people. Art is insanely important. It, it, it creates the narrative. It creates the idea of beauty. It creates the idea of virtue. It all works together, right? Musicians are prophets. They're priests, Artists are uh, the ones that create the um, the desired atmosphere, the things we work towards. And we lost the arts. Christians lost it because they got too cerebral and they disconnected themselves from the created realm. And and we're watching like the the we've lost we've to, to Dark Blade, we've lost film, we've lost writing, we've lost painting, all things that at one point were dominated by Westerners in their thinking and Christians in particular, we've lost all of them. And so we lost the culture. And if you lose the culture, you're damned. There's nothing you can do. You got to start back. And that's where we're at right now. We're like, it, we're in the ash heap of, of West of the West trying to recover some of the, these things. So I see a guy like take bronze age pervert, right? Very pagan, not a Christian, but he, he, he respects the beauty of the ancients he, he sees with the greeks and all of them well the, the they actually loved god's created realm they might have worshipped it but as, what you're starting to realize with liberals is they hate they just hate and destroy beauty and yeah. so our artists are a pathway back to loving god's created realm amen brother you know you, you said a lot of things that are definitely worth touching on and, and th this is this is yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think that you're also right about that. Um, the Christian art period, they, they, if you see it, they, they went too up there. And their art became about like mandalas instead of these objective classical standards. And then you see that happening. And, that, and then as it happened, the culture starts to divulge. And, you know, we, what Michael's saying is precisely it. People, we need to become active participants in the culture we can't just repeat that politics is down from culture as a mantra without actually caring about the arts or or participating in one way or the other i believe so much that alpha males especially christian alpha males need to understand the role of it so much man and you know if the spiritual men can be the gatekeepers as it was 
you know, so that when somebody brings up some crap, you go, mm, get that out of there. Then, then we'll have, um, it'll be damn useful. So, so yeah. you might have to open up a, a gallery, Michael, and, uh, call it, uh, no, you, I don't know, call it like, like, like Republican spot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I'm a. I checked you out today because I saw Tony was going to have you on. I was like, uh, artists, you know. <laughs> I, like, I, I, and brother, I don't hold that against you, man. Yeah. Because you know, so, so guys, you know, I started this Genesis Council thing, and the idea is just like what you said: using the brush to paint back towards the logos. You know, make art cathartically, but know what it's for. We're and I vet every single member, and I've already rejected five liberals so far. Because I think they just thought it was like an art collective. Because you know, people artists are always trying to join collectives. And then the first thing I said to this skinny, he was wearing this really tight yellow shirt. It kind of weirded me out. But the first thing I said was, "Do you believe in freedom of speech, the right to bear arms, and the family?" And he looked at me like, "Is this an art art collective? What the hell is this?" And I was, I couldn't help but chuckle because his whole thinking was like, "What kind of like? I'm not trying to join the GOP. What is this?" And I told him, "Listen." We're not just our collective. We want specific values upheld. If we're going to support each other creatively, we need to support the right ide ideals creatively. And then this guy felt a little uncomfortable. I said, you know what? I just did that phone hang up. I said, I'm going to refund you on PayPal. I just dropped the call. <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I rejected five so far. And it's just because there's no place for artists who believe in conservative traditional values and traditional aesthetics to support each other. There is not. I've been a part of two art collectives so far. That's not much, but both of them. It's just a reason to go out and have a social club drink and, and share your vehemence about your anti-Americanism and then show your little art projects. No. This, no. this was the whole point of bringing Arthur on tonight, too, was to – I know when I put artists up there, people are going to say, okay. And, of course, Michael Foster and Arthur are both co-speakers at 21 – 21 convention coming up so you guys I'm excited you, arthur you're awesome brother this is my alley man i've been a fan of yours michael it takes on no one i'm i'm uh oh, that's crazy uh, yeah. this is great like you are this you are look i i'm not giving a flattery um but uh this is what we need we need like so what i like about what i hate in the world are talkers and not doers i have no patience be doers right? of the world that's right. And artists create things. And if you create things that are beautiful, that, so uh, ugly is bad. We, I don't know why we can't say this. We want beautiful music. We want beautiful architecture. So I, I used to live in Hyde Park, Cincinnati. We moved from there. So now I can reveal my address. Um, but uh, Emily and I would go for walks and there's a cathedral and we'd walk by it and at all the attention to detail. I mean, the craftsmanship. But we would tear up a little bit because we'd walk into our Protestant churches, and I'm Protestant and unrepentant Protestant. But I'd see their very pragmatic, cold, cheap architecture. And then I'd look at these cathedrals, and I'm like, hey, guys, they got us. This is beautiful. Our Lord, look at butterflies. Look at flowers. Look at photosynthesis. Look at everything. What What is not beautiful about this world? Why should we not emulate our creator? What in this world is coldly pragmatic? You know what I mean? And an artist, your job is to stop us and to make us think for a moment about the world around us. And that's why even that abstract stuff, there's a way it can be beautiful. It can yes. be because it like we don't appreciate colors and how they how colors interact. We don't like uh, like the use of space is a huge thing. So I studied art. I took painting. I was going to be an artist. Um, I'm OK. But Emily and I, we used to take art classes together. We used to actually do new Rock classes. on, brother. Together. Yeah, we do nude classes. What's weird about nude classes, people, Christians are always like, how can you do nude classes? And, like, I just tell you, like, it's not erotic at all. You're, like, drawing this naked woman or this dude. And then yeah, after, you're asexual when you're doing a nude class. You oh, you, to, don't, you, you don't think about it. You're just trying to draw. And then yep. they come and yep. look at the drawing you did of them, which is, like, absolutely terrifying. Like, you just drew this naked guy. And he's like, let me see what you did. And you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, help me, Lord. Um, but uh, 
but we just learned to love like creation. Like I, I love the corn across the street. I love watching the wind blow through it. And artists are important to love this world so we can fight for it. So we can fight for what's right. Like, and that's, that's why we used to have musicians out in front playing the drums and blowing the whistle. And we all have become so gluttonous right we like we take these things for granted we don't know what's around us and so men like you that can help like reclaim a generation and help them come alive to the colors and forms and shapes and the glory of this world is very important so i'm excited i'm i'm really excited that's awesome oh man listen i you know that's uh i'm honored thank you for all that man appreciate yeah, well, it praise god just keep Doing Amen. your stuff, Amen, man. Brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All day. All day. Gotta I, I actually have a recommendation for you, uh, both you, Arthur, and uh um Michael. Is uh Terrence Malick is a director that really, really uh has covered a lot of interesting things, including religion. True. I actually find him right. Yeah, Thin Red Line, all those, those yes. good movies. Oh, his newest movie that came out a couple years ago was amazing. Uh Hidden Life, I think, the one about the Catholic guy who wasn't going to fight um with nazi germany he's one of my favorite directors that's why it just made me think about all of this he's one of my personal favorite artists actually recently i just watched uh fritz lang and i just watched uh, metropolis and i think that is one of the most important movies out there right now and i think that movie needs to be shown to more people because it says a lot about what we're going through today and i think it addresses a lot of things that we don't talk about Absolutely. Yeah, you know, Where, film is another way to go. But I mean, and, and and hey, listen, you might be the guy who makes film that brings us back to, you know, it's like every medium, brother. We, we gotta find. I, I'm a an medium. old school film guy. I, I my, my my thing is very inspired by foreign movies. Uh, I'm very in love mm -hmm. with films from like Inmar Bergman and. Federico Fellini, Walk on the Y, Bruce Lee. I'm a huge Bruce Lee fan. When you mentioned that earlier, I'm like, hell yeah, he's one of my favorites. Um, I've been very inspired by um, older films, mostly Japanese, believe it or not. I'm very, I have a lot of respect for Japanese directors, especially Akira Kurosawa, Kobayashi. Um, I, I'm very inspired by these directors who want to tell a story and they're not afraid to tell it. And I, I always say that being. Film art is very not, it, it, people don't understand it. A lot of these liberals are turning it into political pieces, which at the end of the day, they're forgetting the important parts. They're forgetting how to show love. They're forgetting how to, they, they just, some of these directors don't understand and it pisses me off. Arthur, pisses how, me off a little. Oh, sorry. Arthur, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's all good. Arthur, tell me, um, so we have a rule in our house. Everyone gets four years of piano lessons. And our rule for that is simple because uh, year three sucks. Right? right? And we want to get them over the hump. So after after you get over the hump and you get into year four, if you hate piano still, <laughs> it's all good, man. Go do your thing. Um, I find that most things that are skill related, there's a hump that you got to get over. I, I'm curious to hear for you, like, was art automatic? Was a hump to get over? What are the humps been? How did you fall in love? Like, there's a point usually in any skill, whether it's speech or drawing or film or writing, where it's um, it takes effort uh, to to get to the next level. I'd I'd love to hear how an artist um, sure. levels up or what sort of barriers you had to break. So I had like a three and a half year pit <laughs> where, 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 where um, I, ju I just, you know, I, I learned the fundamentals from this five foot, super strict old Korean woman. <laughs> and she, she had this ruler and she slapped the table. I was like, what the hell? But um, I'm thankful to her now because I got all the skill set. But in regards to finding my own voice, that was that was challenging for me because, you know, this is a big deal. I'm, I'm, I'm showing people my public face, uh, artistically. And, um, you're making me want to add another point, which is that there's young artists. 
yeah, if, if there's young artists who are interested in exploring the fine arts, if you see the highest level of masters, and, and I and I look at some of these people are my mentors and, and or some of them are my peers too, you know, there's all these necessary pitfalls for them to get to that point that you may not be aware of. So don't be discouraged. Like like you get to get to the point where I was, it was it was it took me a while to develop this style. It it's it's a life's work. Um but yeah, I, I, I think there's a couple things attributed to what caused me to really connect this. And one was I went through like a prodigal son phase hmm. where I would I, I, I kind of was a late bloomer in regards to my ritual defiance of spiritual authority. You know, usually you do that when like, <laughs> you know, maybe like you're 16 to 19, something like that. But for me growing up, uh, I, 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 I fell away from God briefly. And when I fell away from God, I was said, okay, you know, let me replace that with whether it's psychedelics or um, these alternative philosophies, all these different modalities. And I just was never satisfied because it was so self-centered and it was functioning under the assumption that it's a fully automatic model of the universe with no soul then. You still have to have that functionality. That frame psychologically has to be there. So that was one part of it. And here's the second part that developed my voice. This is really the change of it. Is I couldn't help but deny when I was calling myself this new materialist atheist person. I was telling this to Tony earlier. That I was always, when I was by myself privately in my own studio trying to produce something that would resonate with myself, I was painting religious imagery. So as I call myself this new atheist, I can't help but acknowledge that the heights of aesthetic standards and what I love to paint was religious. So that's when I took this turn and, and realized that, you know, aesthetics are not, they're not just random, they're patterns here. And as I dived into it, that's when I kind of rekindled my relationship to God. And not only that, my, my appreciation for who I'm really going to be in the art world. And that's kind of what I've become. I mean, I've become known for two things. One is being like a blacklisted artist from the woke scene. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the other one is I'm known for being the artist who is trying to make the old new in a way. You know, like I was telling Tony that this, that I've had kids tell me that like, yeah, I have your artwork um, as my, my, my wallpaper. And just because they like the colors, but they have a Jesus cross there and they're looking at it subliminally the whole time. <laughs> you isn't, know what that, isn't that crazy? Isn't it's it crazy? crazy? Like, like things the like influence that. you have, you have, you have intense influence. Artists, you get to shape the world by making beautiful Th things. Th that's why I, I need, I, I, I get so excited by the idea of alpha males finding a medium where they can point it towards the good, man. I mean, I really do. I mean, like people think using your influence towards good has to be having a radio show, you know. And Tony, you're kicking ass with that. Right. But there's other ways to do it. You know, it's just it's not it whether it's at the grassroots, which I do a lot of my work at that level, individual one on one and trying to help people become artists. That's awesome. But it's at every level, you know, and like that's that's the good stuff, guys. That's the uh, that's the Tomahawk steak right there. Hey, so we were talking about. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Michael. Go ahead, man. Uh, on, I was just going to say, which borough are you in? Hold are up. You, wanna, you're you're in NYC? I want to yeah. welcome Kadu. <laughs> Unfortunately, this you. Yeah, it's me. Okay. I know you got to check, man. I yeah, I, you check. Just so yeah, you you know, go. I have to check on who's who's uh, who's on because we do have some trolls. Right yeah, we have some, welcome, some twerking man. men. Yeah, yeah good, to, good to have you here. Good to have you here. Thanks. Arthur, yeah. Arthur, have you made it over to Redeemer down in Manhattan yet? Redeemer Presbyterian. No, I go I go to like a local uh, Korean church, and actually, I have to first go to my father's. On he has a. He does his congregation, but he also has a Zoom on too. Now that now that the COVID has made him this weird uh half, yeah, yeah. So I got to do his, and then I go to Ben local one. I've I've, been, but I got my thing, so I'm gonna just do my thing. You know, I like small churches too, man. Personally. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They're awesome. Yeah. yeah, Redeemer Redeemer had a lot of art. Uh, it was a very Asian church for New oh, York. Oh, really? Called, like heavy Asian. Even yeah, I, I gotta stay away from that then. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> This guy's asking me, what's my, uh, I descend from, uh, I am, what am I, Irish, 
Prussian Jew and uh, I am Pawnee, a Native American. So uh, that is what I, I am. So my grandmother uh, fleed, uh, fled the Nazis. She was in the Battle of Königsberg, uh, fled to Dresden the night before the Americans bombed it. And she was in Dresden when they bombed it, and she made it over to America and and raised wow. me for my life. So, so yeah, um, I on the alt right when they find out that they love a Jew, it's always pretty hilarious. Black excellence. That's um, yep. You guys, so <laughs> I haven't we haven't seen Speeder in a while, man. It's good to see you, brother, for sure. And he is from where Sweden. Is he? Sweden. 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 Yeah. So. It's nice oh. to look white, though. I'm not gonna lie; it works out to my advantage. Yeah. So, wow, wow. We need guys, a... we're missing someone though. We're Caduceus. missing Emmanuel. Caduceus, you hopped in here. Yes, I did, sir. What what questions do you have for Arthur? You got a you got a legit artist here. You 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 are a thinker of sorts. Uh, okay, have? I got a question. Um, when you have a message to to spread, do you think? Portraying it through art adds an element of humanity that you can't do it in any other way, just through the oh spoken word. Or... Very, very well said. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it, it's uh, you know, I've I've had liberals who who love my art and they don't like my perspective, but we almost it, it's not the respect of the art, but because they they the beauty touched them. You know, so we can share that appreciation towards that sort of romanticism. So we won't, we, we can still get along past that. Um, as long as they don't try to make anything up intellectual with me. <laughs> so it's a, like, it makes a bridge just, just because you both like the beauty in it or, or Absolutely. something resonates. Yeah. It's, it's like, um, you know, if, if we have a, a diverse room in here, but you know, it's like, like put it this way, like, let's say we have a bunch of guys here, okay, and, and which we do, but let's say it's politically diverse. Everyone here likes a movie John Wick. I don't care. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> That's just how it is. So I've had that with my art. Because again, I'm not trying to be obliquely political. I'm not, because I think that if, if art touches, if an ideology touches you that heavily, your art, I think it contaminates it. You are who you are, you know, you can, you love, you believe what you, and you do, you have what you love, but you're producing from there, but you're not trying to be like, like, like the Daily Wire is a great example. I appreciate what they're trying to do. They just opened up like a recording studio for conservative musicians. Awesome. Uh, they're, you know, but, but their films sometimes make me cringe because <laughs> it's not, no, because it's like, there's like a scene in one of their movies. It's like, like the guy's coming to the farm and he looks at his daughter. He's like, this is my Second Amendment right? You're like, oh hey. no! I mean, I, I mean, it's like, it's like, what if, what if I just painted the Statue of Liberty, the like American flag, bald eagles with Trump riding? I mean, that'd be kind of cool. But, but what if, what if all I did was paint like typical cliche American symbolism? You don't want to be like, like you want to paint from your soul and do what, what, what you love. And when people ask you what are your inspirations, you just tell them who you are. And it, and that's what I've been doing. And People get offended, and some people like me more for that. So it's a yeah. interesting thing. So a different Bruno once told me, not Tony, but someone close to Tony. He was telling me he was talking to Cernovich, and uh, Cernovich told him how how your how your falling changes you if you're not careful. And that was really insightful. Um, because I don't have a huge Twitter account, it's like fourteen thousand people, but just it seems to be the right type of people that gives me quite a bit of influence with a, a segment. Um, and uh, I do feel like people are trying to owe me a lot of times. Try to they want me to tell them what they want to hear, and and you can play to that and grow your account and grow your influence, but you you do give up your voice. You do give up your independence, right? Mm -hmm. Like your inspiration, whatever you want to call it. And I've learned to do this. Like I, this past week, I preached a sermon. <laughs> I said some things right after I said them. I was like, you know, like when you do something, you know, it's the right thing, but it still was really hard. And, um, 
and I know I lost some people, but I gained some people. And I know like part of the hardest part is honesty, right? And art should be honest. Art should make us look at who we are and what the world is and whatever. And I think trying to not cater to a, we'll take a, what's his name? So uh, the way I got, I got a big following online started with, uh, em, Emily, what's that gay, the gay artist that does all the light, the real famous Christian artist. He, I can't think of him. He's a gay super artist that does all the light. Well, he's not really gay. <laughs> it's just his art's gay. I'm going to get Tony banned from, uh, from YouTube. I'm so sorry. Um, he's a, he's a famous Christian art, Christian artist. Hmm. Um, he works in acrylics. You can tell he does. Oh, oh, you're talking about you're talking about like the uh, what? I think he's called like the um, artist of light. The, I can't the, stand the George him. Bush. He's like the George Bush of art, and I can't think of his name right now. Anyway, the, the, the glowing fag. Really colorful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So everything's <laughs> well, it, look. Uh, his fundamentals, like in terms of perspective and everything, his oh, okay. understanding of light is terrible. Um, oh, whoa. but every like light appears from everything. It appeals to soccer moms. It's like appeals mm -hmm. to everybody. Um, I, I'll think of his name before this night. This night's over, but um, but it's not challenging. Oh, it doesn't cause. I, Speeder wants to know: Is he a Jew? <laughs> I'm he just. Was an I think he was. I don't know, Speeder. Does he have more influence and this power will than you? Determine everything. Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, anyhow. Um, what, what I think about what's hard with anyone that has influence is t you have to learn. Kincaid. Yes, Thomas, Thomas Kincaid. Kincaid. Oh, <laughs> oh, I can't stand him. <laughs> Everything about Thomas Kincaid, I hate. It's it's like produced, careful art meant to appeal to the mm. basis of desires, right? Like it's it's like if your kid yeah, did he's it, like fairy tale Bob Ross kind of feeling. Yes, yes, that's perfect. Let me. I'll, I'll get him on the screen here. <laughs> and and so that's what I want to say is that like, I so he sold out like, uh, Thomas Kincaid clearly it has fundamentals that are are strong. Yeah, you know? yeah, like, he does. He's, he's got the fundamentals, but he sold out at some point. And I I I wrote this long article back in like 2003 why Thomas Kincaid sucks, and it went viral. Back as viral, I was like, oh. he's a terrible artist, guys. I don't know what you're talking about. This is absolutely unchallenging, pathetic artwork that makes your soul rot. Um, and what I keep wanting is Christian artists that will challenge us and press us to think. That's what preachers should do. Like every week, I, I try to think, how can what does this text say to my people that they need to hear? Right. Um, I, I'm curious about that. Like. As you've get, gained some level of fame, apparently people, you're new to me, but I'm I'm glad to have found you. Sure. Um, uh, how do you? Um, how do what, how do I manage? How do I deal with that? How, how do you protect from that 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 desire to perform for other people? Because well, it's, well, well, it's a constant first, challenge me of me. So. Well, I want to first say that, like, um, my respect that you you know it takes more gonads to say to say what's right. Because you know it's right, and to, I don't know, do like a twenty rep squat day or whatever. So, <laughs> so, so first there's that man. Uh, and and secondly is uh, I have a rule when it comes to my my own art making. I go where the art takes me. And if some people are gonna doesn't like it, it doesn't matter. I'm not gonna go. I'm always competing against my last composition. There's also the actual craftsmanship of it where I'm spending my time trying to produce work that I'm happy with, right? So, like, if it's a commission, that's a different situation. But if it's about me developing my voice and style and, and, and evolving as a painter, I'm going to go where the art takes me. And, you know, and often that's a mistake, too. Like, I have paintings that, that are so incomplete. I'm like, I'm going to paint over this because I like some of it. But they're often pitfalls. But I'm gonna go where where I feel like it's gonna challenge me in the right direction towards stepping my game up, you know. And if somebody tells me to do something else, well, and I will say that, but I don't often get that because um, usually, I don't know. Like here, I'll, 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 I'll here's a good answer to it. Um, without, well, maybe it'll seem more pretentious. Anyways, 
I had I I I had a dinner with uh, this one artist. She's got a very big following, um, and you know she makes good money selling these stupid little panda cartoon drawings. Mm-hmm. And we're sitting down talking, and she goes, and she's a friend too. She's a nice girl. And I was down in the wine here. We're just catching up. We're just peers here. And she goes, you know, uh, Arthur, you know, um, your work is, you know, I really admire the paintings you're making. And she's got a bigger following than me. And she goes, I love to, uh, what do you really think of my work? And I said, do you, do you want the truth? Do you want the honest truth? And she says, of course I do. Come on, we're friends. Blah, 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 blah. I said, well, I could master what you do in a day. And I will give you two years to do what I do. To do a taste of what I would you take that bet? She wouldn't take that bet, mm. and and it's it's awkward, but it's a reality that you know. Look, I I'm, I'm painting beyond nine to five a day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And because I'm I, and I'm also blessed to be able to do something I love, so it comes smoother. But you know, um, I, I I'm at the point where it's like I don't want to call myself like at a masterclass point per se, because, you know, I ha- still have mentors and teachers that I, I call and I haven't looked at my work, but I'm at the point where I know what's good art. Like I know, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like I'm a student of art history. I've been, I've been exhibiting for 10 years, you know, like I, I've won artists of the year multiple times. Like, like, like I, I know what's, I know what's good art. So if someone tells me a bad idea, I just, I just, you know, it's like um, someone, someone, saying something slanderous to you probably like you hate gay people or, I don't who do you think is the worst artist today the worst artist today <laughs> well during the art basil when i exhibited in 2019 that that banana duct taped to a wall that sold for 150 $150,000 for money laundering obviously that was pretty bad art or Wh- the, uh, why well, it, it's it's and it's all like it's all radical left, you know. If you go to some of these big art parties, and I used to be invited to them, if you go to some of them, they're all Democrat donors, and I mean the art yep. world at that type of level, they're all on the radical left. They are, and they're that, even they're they're so. Oh, I'm sorry, my voice is really. Oh loud. no, please, please. No, it, it's like when. Right now, with like the whole film industry, we, we've lost what makes people. There's no, there's no voices that speak out that are not liberal, and it's sad to see that they're not conservative or people like me who consider myself more middle ground. We don't see that much anymore, which is free okay. speak of talk, where like there's a film, like I said earlier, films today they're fucked up. That they're not even. I'm sorry, but they're fucked up. They're not I, even the you same. Know, you know what I would say? I mean, there, there are sp- there are people speaking up, but I will also say that most most conservatives. That, so I'm a conservative, so I'm going to speak from from that perspective. But a lot of conservatives I know that like their strategy, or maybe it's because I'm in New York too. I don't know, but <laughs> but a lot of conservatives I know their strategy is hoping the other side has a modicum of conscientiousness, and they'll say, "Oh wait, may, I, I'm maybe." I'm being unpleasant, or, or they're hoping somebody else will pull them to the side. But you give them an inch to take a mile. You just gotta say what you believe, and you know I I kind of admire Jesse Lee Peterson's approach. I heard him explaining his approach on his radio show. He was saying, "Yeah, my thing is that I just I'm I'm just saying what I believe is right, and that's it. And if they get mad or wrong or, or happy, that's actually not my problem. I don't even care." And I'm like, I yeah. maybe should. Think about that, but may, I don't know. <laughs> Gonzo has some artwork that I want the panel to break down because Foster was talking about we need to get the Christian artwork back into the mainstream is kind it of thing. That, is it one of those Muppets? Kind of. I don't know. I don't know if you've seen this, but I, th- I thought it was – I love I love his art, so I thought we'd get the panel breakdown. Well, actually, right. Tony, I've got I – got since would, we talked about Kincaid, I got a Kincaid yeah. up. So we can show people some Kincaid. Here. Oh man, you guys yeah. ready? Stop your volume. Some buffet artwork. Well, while he while he pulls uh, that up, I had a a point that I think is important. It's not that necessarily that it's all on one side, which it is. What's more concerning to me is that the, the newest art that we see getting pushed out 
by guys not like Arthur. You see a lot of soulless art. Like it's just made by the corporate machine and there's no humanity behind it. Yeah. When yeah. Disney. Yeah. Terrible, uh, who did that go back to? That goes back to I'm trying to think of the name of the artist. He's famous for uh drawing busty women. And he actually hired a bunch of people in his studio to reproduce his work. Robert Crumb? No, no, this goes back to the seventeen hundreds or eighteen hundreds. I went to an Ooh. exhibit. His name escapes me. He's actually supposedly a Christian artist. I keep looking Don't to my Bosch. No. Like, like uh, what? What? What period? A couple hundred years ago. So you you can go back a couple hundred years ago, and they would have these art studios where they more or less were reproducing the artist's work in mass to make money. There's still it's, a lot of that. Yep, a lot of that. Um, I dude, we gotta go to the Brazilian Tony. Me, you, and Arthur, and a couple guys gotta head over to that Brazilian grill down uh, here next. Hell month. yeah, it's Let's gonna go. be awesome, and we can. We can talk this stuff. Uh, You're going to have that card on green all day? Just keep bringing that meat towards you? <laughs> oh, man. Dude, those, when I was down down at 21, guys like, Pastor, do you want to go talk about my life? To, I was like, uh, we'll do it at the Brazilian Grill. I was like, yeah, man, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> You're just like, like, I, I want to eat some steak, man. Leave, give me my space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll hear all your problems <laughs> as I eat meat. Just so. cut it right onto your plate. Call it good. The 21 meat convention. Man, the 21 convention keeps leveling up, man. We're getting better and better speakers. What a what a time what a time to be alive where uh, you know, the whole world's yeah. falling falling apart around us, but there's there's voices of sanity that that by the mercy of God, some of these some of these voices of sanity aren't even Christians, but but they I still think God's God's common grace is on them where they're like seeing truth and declaring it. And I, I keep catching a lot of crap for going down to 21, but I'm like, you know what? Anywhere I find honest men that are trying to make, make a difference. Like, why would I not go there? You know? Yeah. I the mean, real like, wealth is here. You know, it really is like, like it's, it's, it's Michael, you know, I've been, I've been offered to be to like in a weird compromise, my beliefs to be a part of bigger galleries and, I bet Why? you have. Why? Why? You know, it's like, what's the point? <laughs> Gonzo, you got that piece? Yeah, Tony, you should see it backstage. Uh, okay. so, Why not show it right here? Oh, okay. There He's going to show it. He's going to pull it up as the host. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, he has to put it up. It's nice and big there. You All right. <laughs> oh, wow. This is Kincaid. So this at first, Kincaid. at first look, it looks good. But as you study the light and where the light comes from, this is actually not a... It's one of his better pieces, if we're going to be honest here. Well, they devolve. They, they, they de <laughs> it's awesome. Michael's shitting on Kincaid here. <laughs> he, 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 devolves, he devolves later where the light doesn't – so his idea is that light should come from everywhere because that represents God. But it really oh, wow. is just, just laziness. Oh, this, wow. this, this stuff appear, appeals to low-level people that just don't understand beauty, you know. Yeah, I, well, I looked him up too, and the the critics agree with you, Michael. Well, it's because I'm right. Because I speak truth. Is, is that <laughs> is that supposed to be art? Mm -hmm. What's that's the, that's the thing with art? Like, it's a lot like a lot of things. Is that, that right? There, like it's it's art. It's it's it, not. It, there's uh, skill there. There's skill there. Yeah, there is. There's I mean, definitely there skill. Is. There. It, it just reminds me. I like me the of, trees. It reminds me <laughs> of something that would be in Disney. I mean. Well, there was a. There used to be. I'm not sure if there is any more. There used to be like a a Thomas Kincaid shop, where you could buy prints and stuff, and it was like at malls and things like that. Yeah, you see this in like Pottery Barn. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. All right. So if you look at this, okay. <laughs> let's, just look at, let's talk. Let's talk about this for a moment, okay? <laughs> what What am I supposed to take away? So, I'll tell you right now the things that stick. That stick out to me. One is the really purple tree. This cat. Mm -hmm. The gate. I mean, what am I? What is this? No, you're, you're, you're asking. You're asking the fundamental question. Uh, whenever you should look at art, you should say, "What is the cultural value?" That that is the question, and um, it's 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 it's, it's a nice. It's like we get a nice garden. Yeah, it doesn't. This it's isn't doing. I got. I found another one here. This one's even crazier. Let me see if I can. Come on. 
Yeah. It's very generic to me. Uh, uh, now we're getting to the now we're getting that. To there the we go. Look at this ball. crap. Look at this. Pity and the Tramp bullshit. <laughs> Looks like Rolo Tomasi land. Ooh. It's devolving. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, this is not oh, good art, guys. Everywhere. Everyone just shits on roll everywhere. <laughs> okay, what's so bad about this? Because Lasad's being kind of gay. What's so bad about this? <laughs> <laughs> that's, it, right there. that's it. That's it right there. <laughs> well, that's a good – that's like like Arthur says here, a primal. You Like, you're detecting something's wrong with it, right? This is a, appealing to sentimentality. That's one thing, right? So we got Lady in the Tramp here. This guy's walking this woman up into her house in this sort of Victorian idealistic age, all these things. This is about uh, comfort and keeping you where you're at and not causing you to think about anything. Not that everything has to be jarring. It doesn't have to be jarring. But art, good art definitely um, invokes something. Yeah. Yeah. It you does. Know, I'm, I'm thinking of all the taxes these people are paying to maintain all these flowers, man. <laughs> yeah. no, so, so there's, so, there's so much skill here. But I don't know why. I just thought of uh, you guys remember when Eminem did that fuck Donald Trump rap thing? Yeah. Like, of course, Eminem's not like, of course, he's got his own issues. But during his heyday, like uh, his lyrical ability and the balance and the fun, there was something to listen to in regards to his to where he was coming from. There was an authenticity. I think people reward authenticity. And then when he did that f Donald Trump rap, it felt so. Uh, like like I'm I'm being controlled by an ideologue, and I think I I think that's a analogous intent to what I'm feeling here, which is that this artwork is coming from a place of uh, like like, hey you know uh yeah you Disney lovers come it's a on grift. over yeah, yeah it's yeah, all yeah. grift you know, it's a lot of skill but it's a lot of skill that doesn't come from a person who's like put it Kincaid isn't going deep enough. I don't mind this drawing here at all. I don't. This X one. This is actually a really pretty decent one. I think. Hey, so so I, I just I just did. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Mike. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Bob, me. No, I was I was gonna say I just did an event with uh, uh, 9/11 first responders and the Special Forces Foundation, uh, Green Beret vets, and I had a, I unveiled this work called Kingdom Come. Um, put that one up. Okay. That's the move right there. Yeah. Yeah, or just go on my website and then just zoom into that one. Oh, bacon. Yeah. We got fr yeah. I was gonna get y'all's reaction to uh, <laughs> Francis Bacon here. <laughs> Hang on here. We'll do. Um, Let's go to my website. Yeah, here. Uh, got it wrong. I got it wrong. There we go. I what wrong. sort of websites will come up on Gonzo's browser? <laughs> <laughs> all, we don't we're all, we're all, all right, so go to well, he's on the incognito window, though. I think. <laughs> Gonzo suggested searches. <laughs> yeah, um. All right, go a little lower. Nope. Yeah, yeah. This is the one. I, yeah, that one up there. Kingdom Come. So, so this one. Oh, cool. for, this one for awesome. like this is done with a lot of symbolism. So here's the thing. Kincaid's skill was also very strong, but you can see skill here. But with this here, we have this line here. It's an alpha male line, and <laughs> if you look at the iconography of a line symbolically, nobody has taken the religious symbol of a line further than the Christians, obviously. And the That's line, man, right? Well, 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 I didn't know this, but if you study art, his like the line isn't just about power or, or like Michael like, or something. The, no, it's 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 this idea of like like benevolent masculinity and like fatherhood almost. It's it's something of that texture, and it's surrounded by these cigar leaves because uh, all these um all these green beret vets like. I'm connected with them at a cigar club. And we were always smoking cigars. <laughs> and in the back, we had the Battle of Iwo Jima, the raising of the flag. Um, and my, my, the whole sentiment of this is that I was trying to convey patriotism without it being some, uh, like, without, without it being that cliche that I was talking about. So this work, I wanted to embody that masculinity and, and patriotic sacrifice that undergirds our freedom that, uh, that these wokies take advantage of. So, red. You need to make a bald red. eagle with French what? toast. Yeah, what oh, red? This red is really powerful. Does it draw the eye? Is that why? Well, there's definitely a color combination reason as well. You know, if, if you look it off, here's a good way to explain it. Let's say you see a, um, like, a, I don't know, like, like a giant basket, and, it, and it's full of, like, 
I don't know, like blue balls, okay? And if I put one orange ball, where is it going to go? Orange. orange ball, right? Now, but if I put four orange balls, now it's going to move a little bit. So, I mean, I'm always playing with the placement of how I can guide the viewer's eye. Because color is not just about the tone. It's about the contrast of how you can mm -hmm. uh, make things go in and out. So, yeah. I, I mean, I am a colorist here. But the, another thing about my work, though, you got to see it in person. It is thick with two C's. They, these oh, works, yes. they, they're visceral. They, they come out. There's so much dimensionality. I want it to be thick so that when they hang it up and the light hits in the morning, there's shadow from the side of the painting. I want it to be like like um, frosting. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I, love that. I like I like that purple that you've got. That purple outline around the uh, the statue of the 911. Yes, the Iwo Jima. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. Oh, thank you, my friend. Yeah, that's that's the middle ground. You, do you, um, Arthur? You do this in um, <clears throat> in uh, pencils, and then you come over top of it. Yeah, I, I, uh, my phase is um, people have different phases. My phase, I draw a sketchbook. I do get a lot of sketchbooking, and once I get the composition, I draw it all out on the canvas or wood panel, depending on uh, what's going to be better for the aesthetic. And then, uh, yeah, I didn't. I, These strong lines, man. This nose, all this. Gonzo, this could we look at all and everything? Thank you, brother. Yeah, I was actually, you know, I was going to ask you about that one, right? Because you were talking about the contrast and everything and like how how you know, everything's right intentional. Yeah. So I was going to ask you, like, is this, is, you know, because this face is has the highest contrast, I think, of anything. And that's, that's what I was telling him earlier. That's what stuck yeah. out to me the most. Every time I think of that painting, I see the face immediately. Yeah, that's Caligula there for you. This, this, this notion Caligula. of a man abusing power. So I, I told this to Tony, the top end, they're all celestial figures, but they're all things that we should protect that are sacred. That's what the lamb is at the bottom end of that top end as well. And then around it is also the sword of Damocles. And in the middle, we have all these warrior-like figures, mm -hmm. those that will defend and preserve that which we have to archetypally. And the bottom is the underworld. We have Yamataka, Medusa, Death, you know, terrible leaders. And then in the center bottom is a Slavic interpretation of this Phoenix. So these are all like symbolically placed and I'm trying to show different cultural representations of it because this idea that Campbell talks about that there's universalities that ties together. That's something that I'm really attracted to. The, the bottom piece, the last piece, I think it's called Apex. Uh, I think uh, it's a part of this Canadian collection now. That is just all these warriors and conquerors around the world surrounded with apex predators people love this one people love this one that siberian tiger looks like it's it's uh gonna eat your heart right <laughs> that's yeah. amazing dude. Yeah. Yeah, there's so oh, much going on there i mean i look at i look at this compared to what we just looked at the um Kincaid. whatever the guy yeah i mean <laughs> look at let's compare I mean, you guys, <laughs> no, 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 no. Right. guys guys Kincaid. Uh, i don't want people to like say oh arthur lee shits on Kincaid, but no, no, but Kincaid's got a lot of skill but mm. but it's 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 like he he knows all the all the the words but he's not you know what i mean he does not a dance what is it saying like there's no like, there's no heart in it exactly it, it, like he's not painting like himself and you can tell because you can find so many painters like him. Um, you want to make it your own. And the ownership is important to find your own voice. Whenever I show people, like, again, like, um, I have people that want to learn this, the game. And I tell them all these things, but I tell them, again, you have to learn the rules to break the rules, like anything else. So what we're going to do is we're going to get you all the stuff, all the techniques that are necessary to, to formulate art at this level. But do not let it limit you so you're not expressing your creative energies. You know, it's a double-edged sword. Like, you use what's useful for you. The Bruce Lee thing, you know? So we're going to go Jeet Kune Do on this shit. You know, I'm being mad Asian right now. But Anybody got a joint? Huh? <laughs> Anybody got a joint? I, I mean, psychedelics has definitely influenced my <laughs> art, brother. 100%. Yo, uh, Foster, pass the stogie. <laughs> a glass is class, brother. <laughs> Foster's back there hogging up the uh, doobie. Pass it, Foster. Pass it around. I, I left for a second. What did I miss here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you we're, had to just, ask we're, just, uh, we're, just, we're just shitting on Kincaid. Yeah, still. <laughs> oh, this, this guy right here, this blue guy, looks like the new bad guy from the Marvel movies. He's that. Oh, that, God. That, King that, the Conqueror? That, that's right, King. This is King right here. 
I don't know which movie this is. Okay. It's in the show, Loki. Oh, okay, cool. No, we have uh, uh, Sun Tzu at the top. We have uh, William Wallace on the left that looks like, um, I guess, uh, laser eyes over here. <laughs> we have Leonidas, Kimu Shin, Julius Caesar, Genghis Khan. These are just like central wars and conquerors. And then these are all the other animals here are oh, uh, apex predators. Killer whale, the hawk, the samurai is bad at this. Yeah, that's an unknown samurai. But if you see the condition of it, I saw the samurai at the Met. The condition of it is so clean. You know he was high ranking. Because otherwise, they, they, you know, he must. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some sort of lines going on over here, all the way to the right. There, it almost, I was trying to see, it looked like it was some sort of an instrument. Yeah. Yeah, it's just explosive. I like to throw a lot of paint. I, I, I like to be explosive with the compositions. You know, it's, um, it's funny, like you'll see a beginner. When you see absolute beginners, they use their wrist a little bit and then they get more comfortable. They use their elbow and it'll start standing. Eventually they're fencing. They're just fucking throwing paint around and just adding it because they're at the point where they can have the confidence to do something of that. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. I love to throw that shit around, man. And again, this is why it's so important to the, AB, the basics are your best weapon. Get the technical skills, learn line, learn proportion, get it in. And the muscle memory that, that the, the work to time ratio, that is, it's a lot, but you get that settled and man, go make some magic, man. Like I, ha I had, a, I had this kid once contact me saying, Hey, you know, I've been having this dream and I really want to paint it. I want to paint this dragon and all this stuff. I said, okay, the first thing I need you to do is you're going to get some fruit, put it in a bowl, and draw that for me. And then he goes, what the fuck? And that's not what I said I want to do. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, yeah, but this is going to get you there, brother. You know, like, that's the move. Did you start with the the tiger or... Well, I started with. Um, I'm you asked that, Michael Foster, because I'm curious too. Where can you possibly start? What's well? What's really weird? Look at the blue guy, right? He's like got the, of all these faces, he's the most stark face, and of the most detailed face is probably the tiger, right? So I, I'm looking at it. I'm thinking. I feel like it's one of these two, but I don't know which one. I could be wrong though. I definitely. So like in this situation, I started with the tiger. Okay. Now, yeah. now, now, at what point of this painting did you realize it was going to be Conquerors since you start with the tiger? Or did you have that vision from the start? Oh, yeah. I, um, I wish I had my sketchbooks here. I have these, like, every single painting you see here, I have, like, a drawing of, like, it briefly done. Um, I actually sketched with a pen, ballpoint pen. And I just kind of gesturally capture everything. And, it, you know, just okay. to get the essence of everything. And once I kind of get the gesture, 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 and it feels right, and I realize which way the marker making is going to go so it can flow, I go, okay, this is, um, this feels right. You know, um, I'm glad that a lot of these expressions I cannot fully articulate with the language because so much of it is intuitive, and that's why there's an authenticity to it. That's why you can feel the explosiveness because I was painting at that moment with a fresh feeling. And that's why... What Michael was talking about with Kincaid, like Kincaid has all the skills, but he's not painting with any, any, there's no source. No you heart. Know? There's no heart. There's no heart. No heart. There's no, See, you look at it. That's the thing. This is, um, this is back, uh, someone's drawing, uh, here's how we're going to set, make this scene for this movie, right? They're not, um, it's world building. It's hey, to hey, Tommy, we need some stamps now. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I the thing is that's what's hard for people to understand about art. Like there is an emotion, there is a message that needs to be communicated by it, and there's a multiple styles that can um, accomplish that. Like, look at this bear back here; he's buried. Like, if you that a, that, the bear's much more loose. Yeah, that's true. And you look at him, and you want like, what's what's the bear do, right? Like. You look at all of it, there's these layers. So the samurai, you move over to who the hell is this guy and this bear. Like if you've ever been to an art museum that has that has a good curator that knows how to pick good art. Did y'all notice the gladiator to the right of the tiger? To the right of the tiger. Sort of That's got like a mohawk thing going. Yeah. Leonidas. The Spartan? I just yeah, know the Spartan. Spartan. Oh, yeah. Leonidas. Yeah, That's funny you mentioned that because that's exactly what I was trying to figure out when you said that. Mm -hmm. 
That is Leonidas. Oh yeah, Spartans. Whew. Tonight we dine in hell. Hey, we that, are Spartans. It was pretty cool. I was reading um uh how how the Romans. I know, I know it's not Spartans, but but how how the Romans um it just made me think of this. How they would recruit. They looked for certain characteristics in men, and everyone would just think there's going to be brutish, but they had a list, and and the first thing was has a sense of humor. Because they want men who have the confidence to have brevity during these long, mm. long trips. And it, yeah, it's interesting. And the second one is, um, uh, it, it was just so interesting with the context. Like they wanted, they're super cardio heavy and uh, a lot of it was psychological. And I think that, I think the ancients, they understood that like, you know, I think we're so fooled by the physical world today. And uh a part of art is bringing that inward notion out to the physical, you know, so we can kind of point people back in a little bit. But, um, yeah, it just made me think about that. You know, these, these empty eyes were interesting to me. Yeah, that are, is, no, pu no pupils. When we look at the other well, – who was the other guy, Kincaid, you said? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like <laughs> – Michael, this is, this is the Kincaid and Rolo shitting room, it seems so like. Yeah. <laughs> you have – when I don't you, apologize for anything. Yeah. When I give credit that. where credit's due. I, I admit that Rolo is a great investigator and uh, putting together things. I admit that Kincaid's a talented artist. It, but in the end result of what they're trying to produce. Yeah, bottom line. Bottom line. In the bottom line, it's not not yeah. what I'm going for. Guys, this is this is why like I like I'm gonna say it right now. Like uh I wanted to tell this to Anthony in person, but that's why I appreciate his um, his cleansing of the manosphere, because because the contra because his notion like the, like even the patriarch the patriarch convention, just that I mean the biggest contradiction I see in the manosphere that is trying to be ameliorated, you know it's in the works of it, is uh, this notion of saying that, you know if masculinity is conservatism. You're, you're speaking of that in your private life, but in your public sphere, you're showing off your body count. You know, it's, it's, um, this is something that I've, I've, been, I've been noticing about the, uh, the manosphere, but I think that you notice that the speakers are becoming more, uh, you know, conservative in that route, more and more mm -hmm. as years hey, go on. I want to see Gonzo's meme sketches because uh, these speak to me. They really do. The, the expression on these guys' faces really have Show a lot Gonzo. of emotion. Show us. Yeah, pull that up. Yeah, it's on. It's backstage. Um, oh, baby. Is this the Christian it's one? Backstage. Show them all, Gonzo. Yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> I'll get a. I'll That's get a pretty little, cool. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so, so it's uh, just it's, it's, it's the it's, expression. It's, it's, is he, is he saying like? Is he saying like? Do I want to? Read the Bible right now, or do I want to? Like, so, listen? so the the way the way I interpret this, Gonzo uses these sketches for like um, uh, for video over his podcast. And so, if you notice, the guy's got headphones on; he's got a Bible. Well, we we talk a lot about Christianity, you know, some theology, religion, God stuff like that. So, to me, what this what this picture represents is this guy's got his Bible, like he was reading it. He's listening to the podcast. But he's also like dejected because he's kind of lost in a sense. Yet he's got the Bible near his heart, and he's like yearning to know. But he's got this sort of like, you know, um, just sort of like lostness about him. That's how I. That's how I. I uh, enjoy this this piece. Mm. And he's got his little iPod or phone next to him. You know, he's listening to the podcast with his Bible just in case he wants to reference it. Or maybe he was doing some reading and just said, screw it, put it on his chest. He's like, I'm, I just forget about it. I'll just listen. He's like screaming, Tony, Tony, we need help. But I was curious to how you fellas uh, thought about what y'all thought about this little twist. I yeah, think it's maybe a better man today. Gonzo, you have any more? Uh, yeah, I, I do. I've got well, yeah, I've got a, I've got a series of them here. Let me. Actually... Uh, I'm, I'm thinking on this one though. I noticed that the headphones go under the Bible, almost like someone put it on his chest while he was listening. Mm, that's right. It's like layered. It's layered. We're we're talking about layers here. 
And I'm getting this this sense of like this guy's sort of vulnerable, sort of scared. Look how he's like tucked into his 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 bed sheet, like all the way up to his neck, and he's just like laying flat on his back. You know, he's sort of kind of scared in a sense. <laughs> this guy looks very fearful. He looks miserable. He looks yeah. miserable. Yeah. <laughs> there he is. Again. <laughs> Is this the same guy, Gonzo? Is it's it? the same guy. It's the yeah, same, it's the guy. same guy. So, hey, um, once he starts wearing beanies and spinning <laughs> plates, he'll be a happier guy. Um, <laughs> I remember <laughs> this. <laughs> That's fitting at the times. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I, oh, actually, and this one actually isn't even isn't even a one, but I think it might actually mean something. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Oh, <laughs> Whoops! Blank face. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm curious of, of Arthur. What do you think of this style of artwork? This is digital art. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's um, it's very uh macabre and um, uh yeah, it's it's I I think. I think you you, you got a lot of tools to to take it to the next level brother but but i i think you're capturing the expression and tone of something very relevant today and and i appreciate the symbolism with some of the objects mm -hmm. it, it uh, there's a lot of potentiality in this you know yeah well i'll just say um as far as like I don't know what this what this means or what this uh, what this means. I guess uh, the uh, I mean, there's there, there's all these people and they they say they they're happy, um, or and maybe they'll go on Twitter and they'll say actually I'm like depressed, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know actually something happened uh, the other uh, day. Or, or actually, no, no, it was today. I heard about this uh, meme going around. Have y'all heard of this? It was like the the guy from Blue's Clues. <laughs> the host from Blue's Clues. He literally. I saw it. He oh, returned yeah. twenty years later, and he had this message, and he was like saying all this, like. Thank you guys for being there with me. I never forgot you. I went to college, up. and I had student I debt. <laughs> yeah, and and everybody like all these people responded, and they're like. They're like tearing up and stuff and yeah. it's kind of this uh, huge meme but yeah it was just like what a mess <laughs> yeah what a mess it, but i think uh, uh basically basically it's just a meme because you know everybody's miserable but they're comfortable they're cozy they're cozy and comfortable mm -hmm. and so it's kind of got like a children's book sort of vibe going on because uh, that's uh i don't know people are nostalgic and they're uh they're cozy and they're miserable. You should so do a children's book. Well, well, guys, listen, Arthur has to head out, but I do want to get some final words from Arthur. Um, and I'm going to throw him up on the big screen here. So, Arthur, I appreciate you so much coming on. This has been awesome. It was great meeting you, um, you know, whatever it was, about a month or so ago. And I was so glad that you spent time with us tonight. It's been great. You know, I'm humbled. I'm honored that you came on my tiny channel. And Thank you. You know, Tony, Michael, God, I, Primal, all, Dark Blade, Cad Caduceus, right? Caduceus. Yeah, Caduceus. Caduceus, cool. Uh, th thank you all for having me also. Um, I look forward to seeing some of you at the 21 convention as well, of course. And, uh, you know, my, my thing, gentlemen, is um, I'm really passionate about the culture war, and I think that we need to bring back beauty standards and universal standards and to combat aesthetic relativity. I'm really big on that. And I think the only way we'll do so is if men participate in the arts actively. And I have uh, on my phone wallpaper, uh, I just have this quote written that, you know, tradition is not the worshiping of the ashes, but it's preservation of fire. And I think that art is a great tool to maintain those standards of objectivity and we can still do all that in our own way. So you can find me on, uh, I don't, I don't, I probably should do Twitter, but, um, I have an Instagram, Arthur Kwon Lee. You can find me at arthurkwonlee.com. 
And if you're, you're on Twitter, though, aren't you? I followed you today. Oh, yeah, but, you know, it's like Twitter Twitter uh, deleted me, and I started over because I said something about okay. Black Lives Matter. So I'm kind of <laughs> like, you know, whatever. I mean, um, <laughs> I was just hoping that was you that I followed. But for yeah. everybody, too, I do have. They, uh, they were just trying to keep the fire going, man. Yeah. Just, there, there, there you go. Well, 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 well I said that um, – this was uh, I, they, they deleted my account when it was like at the heat of it and it was getting retweeted by Christopher Wright, like a lot of black conservatives. And I wrote that like Black Lives Matter is a modern uh, black base where a bunch of white liberals go on the streets using the black identity to push their liberal agenda. And then that got taken down immediately. <laughs> but um, yeah, if, if, if y'all are interested in supporting, Go find my article on .com. If you are a young creative or if you're just somebody who wants to learn the fine art world or wants to be a part of a collective of artists who are taking the culture back with multiple learning resources and a highly vetted community, you can enter the Genesis Council as well. And there's nothing like this right now. So, uh, yeah, those are my uh, two pitches right there. Excellent. And I do have links to your Instagram, to the Genesis Council, and to your website in the description of the video. So everybody okay. check it out, man. All my beautiful brothers. Uh, yeah, spend some, I gotta... spend some time and check out his artwork, guys. Everybody's watching this in the future. And uh, spend some money and get some of yeah. his prints, too. There you go. You know, support support a guy who's doing great work, too. And that's important in, in our, you know, in our sphere, under our umbrella. I think it's good that we support guys that are doing work like he is so i think that's real important amen i tweeted your stuff out i'll be following you brother and i'll be recommending people to check you out i saw jack murphy uh follows you and retweeted when i retweeted too so that's awesome um that's that's amazing you, you know it's i should probably get on my twitter game right i don't even have it on my phone like, uh dude twitter you know are you are you like you're an artist are you on instagram is that where you're at it's just because it's an image board, and it's like after they deleted it, it's like I, I could have probably got, but I just should have capitalized on getting them all back again. But I just didn't bother at all. But I think you find you find the medium that suits you and finds what you were doing. Yeah. But but I'm I'm encouraged. I think uh, our young men. What I want to encourage you, Arthur, if I, if you allow me, is our young men are cer cerebral and detached from beauty. And they are in desperate need of artists so they can come back to beautiful things that in the real world. And um, I am so excited. I, I, I was texting Anthony during, during this, you know, I'm so excited you're going to be at 21, man. We, we need we need uh, we need voices like you and uh, bring it hard and keep doing what you do. And don't let them uh, don't let the parasites suck the life out of you and uh Super encouraging, Michael. Yeah. I appreciate it. And listen, listen. Um, whether it's you, Michael, or Tony, or Promo, I mean, Elliot, Anthony, like, we're gonna take the culture back, guys. We can't be stopped. Like I'm telling you. So I, I I'm um, thank you for those words, man. All right, guys. Well, I'm gonna end the stream. Um, anybody else, real quick, because I know Arthur has to go. Yeah, yeah. I'll just say that um, I think it's important, even if we're not good at art, um, to find an outlet outlet that we can share. Because we're in a position where I know, at least in the the black pill side of things, where some people even label us as domestic terrorists in a way. And I think just dropping some art, whether it's a freestyle like what Hold the Truth Hostage does, or a painting or whatever can show that there's humanity and we're trying to make positive change instead of destroy. I think that's, I think that's important. Excellent. I appreciate that. Anybody else? Real quick, I, you know, down. thank you for coming on. Honestly, it really has opened me up to want to do my uh, own stream to talk about the film and get the voice out there to talk about, honestly, what we need to talk about. And, you know, you know, right now we're, we're so people are so close minded and I feel like people think, oh, all artists are liberals, but most there's a lot of conservative artists out there who want to say the truth. And I appreciate that. 
Primal, Gonzo? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say, I, I never realized more specifically what Foster was saying about bringing art back um, into Christianity. I never really paired the two together like that. But it's true, and I sort of opened my eyes up, and then I don't see why Kawan is not a big leader in that. So I like that. Kawan, you are a unique guy. You're part, you know, your little your little part, your little intention is unique to me. I like it. Thank you, brother. I mean, I mean, I'm just uh, you know, in my own way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gonzo. It's been amazing. It's been an amazing conversation. I've been enjoying listening in. Uh, and I appreciate everybody's input. So, yeah. yeah. All right, guys. Well, amazing. I'm going to end this. Arthur, again, I appreciate you so much. I appreciate everybody on the panel. And I'm going to say, make art great again. And we're going to make end art great right again. All right, guys. Make have a great night. again. God bless y'all. See you, bro. Thank you. You too, man. Good night.